Okay, wonderful. Thank you to everybody. We had a very engaging and um, informative morning session. So um, we'll jump into um, the afternoon. Something's honking. Um, so we have an out. We're actually you're going to get a break this afternoon. Okay, so you you will get a chance to get up, stretch, and um, we have um, two. Um, uh, we're talking groundwater depletion, we're quantity and quality. We got two half hour uh, talks here. Um, I, I think the way we did it last time worked reasonably well. Um, if each speaker focus charges about 25 minutes and we have a, a few couple questions about each talk and then um, after, when we're done, we should have a, a good half hour or so um, for Q&A before we take a break at three. So maybe at that, maybe after we'll have both both panelists come and sit together and have a, is that a good way to do it? Yeah, let's let's shoot for that. So Jay, I will wave um, at you at about when this about five minutes left. Okay. Twenty five to, to say hello or to get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, if you notice that if you notice that uh, picture that was up in the last slide, I was. I was smiling, and that's uh, because we just moved from Southern California and been there for like 20 years, and, and 10 years before that at uh, University of Texas, where things were, were quite warm. And um, so, some of, as some of you know, we moved to Canada uh, last summer, and uh, so I just want to <laughs> go through the evolution of our wardrobes. Uh, so the date on that is August 15th, okay, uh, and that's the moving trucks that we're moving in. Um, so yeah, grass is grass is green, um, and let's see. Then this is the last day of summer. This is September 21st. Okay, and you know then the then the you know season progressed, and we went to AGU, and then right after AGU, here we are. Okay, and you can see look at you can see the snow out the window in the back there in the back deck. Yeah, yeah, we're smiling. Yeah, you can't see because we're under the face, the neoprene face mask, which you know are part of the part of the wardrobe. Uh, anyway, it's been it's been great up there. So um, uh, actually, I, this is not the. I meant to take this slide. I hope I gave you the right slides because this isn't supposed to be there. But uh, let me see. What will I talk? No, we'll skip that because I'm not going to talk about that stuff. Uh, wow, did I give you the wrong presentation? It's entirely possible. Hold on. This would not be the first time that I've done it. I think I gave you the wrong presentation. Uh, well, we can adjust on the fly. Let's just do that, okay? Okay, so uh, while you look at these pictures of me and my wife, uh, I'm gonna tell you that really most of what we are talking about, uh, that I'll be talking about today, is groundwater depletion as viewed from space. Um, and you know what? I should, can we just take like five minutes to get the right slide? Swap out. Yeah. We have time. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. We, we can, we can adjust. I thought that was so many Is there anybody who hasn't done it would be the, but it would be the question. Because it wouldn't, wouldn't be me. Yeah. Okay. Thank 
Okay, take two. <laughs> okay, so listen, last time I did this, we did the, it's, I've, I've done it once before that I can remember, is used the wrong slides and have to change. It was at a Chapman conference and it's in Hawaii. I actually had to go back to my hotel room and come back and do it. Uh, uh, but I thought the talk went swimmingly after that. So <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how we do here. So I can tell you more stories of the prairies while Carly's getting that, getting that loaded up. It's taking time. You're going to see those pictures again. Hmm, let's see. We tried little boots. Do you see the dog there? We tried little boots for the dog, all varieties of little boots for the dog, because we're talking about minus, minus 40 C and minus 40 Fahrenheit. Yes. Yes. Just freezes there. No, no. It's just, you know, we were happy when we got there and then it, the smile just froze into, into position. Did your Southern California car freeze? Uh, we left it behind. Wow. Yeah, we had to sell the cars and buy all-wheel drives. And yeah, yeah, and engine block, you know, cars have to have engine block heaters. And I forgot all about winter tires. So you buy the car, then you have to buy the tires, then you have to store the tires. And Do you have to really have a long warm uh yes yeah yeah it's about they're about it's about half the year it's about six and six yeah i'm running out of material carly how are we doing <laughs> okay i don't speak canadian no and i never really when i was you know, you know we loved living in austin but you know i'll never say y'all you'll never hear me say it um and well, I'll never say a only is it not even really as a joke. It just doesn't work, right? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's been. <laughs> this is the right one. This is definitely the right one. All y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then there's the, uh, my favorite is the double y'all, which like, y'all get y'all some food, right? Get y'all. <laughs> all right. Okay. So back to the presentation. Hmm. Uh, okay. So there we are. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you about is uh, the work that we've done with the Grace Mission. And I think many of you know about GRACE, but uh, for those of you who don't, it's called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. The first phase flew from 2002 to 2017, uh, kind of a novel satellite mission in that um, it functioned more like, uh, okay, now it's, not, now it's not working. Now we're just frozen. There we go, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm capable of doing this with no slides too. So if I, you know, worst comes to worst, we can do that. Okay, so uh, the mission is configured like, like this. The uh, satellites are up at 400 kilometers, roughly separated by about 200 kilometers. And you know, they're not, they're not very big. They're about the size, if you put four of these tables together, that's about the size of the, of the satellites. You can see that, you can see that here. And so it's a little bit unique in the sense that it really functions more like a scale. And the way that works is that as these two satellites, they follow each other around in this tandem orbit, they go over the poles. And as they fly over a place that's gained water mass, say because of I don't know, a lot of snow in the Appalachians or something, um, that region has gained water mass. And so it exerts a slightly greater gravitational tug on the satellites, pulls them down, separates them a little bit, pulls them down just a little bit towards the surface. And likewise, when they fly over a place that has lost water mass like you know drought in the western united states or groundwater depletion from the big aquifers then those regions have lost water rate and this and so they have they exert slightly less of a gravitational tug on the satellites and they float a little bit higher inter-satellite distance changes a little bit so really what the mission does is measure the position of the satellites there's like the position of the actual scale moving up and down in response to more water mass less 
water mass. So you can see the ups and downs on a monthly basis, but you can also analyze the long-term trends. And that's information that we didn't have before. Uh, so it's been kind of fun. We were just talking at lunch, and it's been kind of fun to just sort of think about what these new data are, are telling us. They tell us, one thing they tell us is the change, not the absolute amount. So we can't, right, we need a whole bunch of other measurements to understand how much water is on the ground or underground. But they tell us the change, so the delta S and in the total, all of the snow and the surface water and the soil moisture and the groundwater together. So if we want to pull out the groundwater, we use simple algebraic methods to do it, but uh, uh, there's uh, maybe perhaps I've oversimplified that, but uh, it, it's possible and I'll show you some examples. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like the be all and end all of remote sensing in that the time scales are coarse and the spatial scales are coarse. So we're talking about monthly and longer time scales and large areas, 150,000 square kilometers and greater. So it's a challenge. So what it has been great for is informing policy makers, the public, uh, doing research on big picture hydrology has been more of a challenge to bring this down to the scale at which water management decisions are made. And of course, for that, we really need all the information we can get on the ground. And this is complimentary. Uh, I will show you a slide on some work that we're doing now and trying to get it to higher resolution. And it's fairly accurate um, in the sense that, um, well, we say it's a one and a half centimeter equivalent uh, water height accuracy, meaning that the change in the storage over this big area, 150,000 square kilometers or greater, has to be a centimeter and a half. Okay, to perturb, that's how big the, the, the mass change has to be to affect the satellites. And so if you're in the desert, that's a big number. And if you're in the Amazon, it's a, it's a, tiny, it's a tiny number. Um, so that mission uh, uh, was decommissioned at the end of 2017, and then the follow-on mission just launched in 2018. And I had the good fortune to be there. It was very cool. It was at Vandenberg and very moving because for me, you know, I spent much of my career right from the start uh, before the mission was launched in about 1995, started uh, 1996, started working with the GRACE science team and pre-launch and now continue to work with the follow-on. But the whole mission, a lot of the results we have really sort of fit into a uh, sort of a sweet spot in, in my career that allowed us to see some things that I'll share with you today and also think about how to act on them, which I haven't quite figured out. Um, so let's take a look at some of what we have, have found. So one of the most important things I think maybe for this presentation um, is a trend map that looks like this, and this is taken out of a global picture. So we'll look at the global picture in just a minute. So what we're looking at here is changing total water storage all of the water storage change. And so, I mean, all of snow, surface water, soil, moisture, groundwater, could be in reservoirs, could be in rivers, wherever it's, it's all the water. Blue is gaining and red is losing. And this is for almost the whole grace time period, 2002, 2006. And so these are the trends. Um, and so when we look at the United States, we see that the upper half is getting wetter and the lower half is is getting drier, okay? Um, and it's pretty much west to east. The big hot spots in the US for losing water are the central valley or aquifers, right? A big food producing region. So the Central Valley and the Ogallala, we heard about parts of parts of this, this story this morning. So those are certainly huge signals and they're some of the biggest signals for groundwater depletion in the world. About 60% of what we're looking at, this is a change in total, about 60% of what we're looking at, because we've done studies in these various spots, is, uh, is groundwater uh, storage change. This big blue spot here actually goes up into Canada. So this is you know, sort of indicative of the changing extremes. So we're starting to see the increasing f flooding in the upper Missouri River Basin and Calgary and Alberta show up in these data. Um, We've done some studies uh, looking at how we could use these data in, and I don't, I don't have those here today, but uh, so Matt Rodell has been using this in the US Drought Monitor, and we wrote a paper a few years ago about on the flood side, which doesn't really get as much attention with the GRACE research, but how to use it to improve flood potential prediction, not flood prediction, but the potential for flooding given the regional, given the regional wetness of the uh, of the landscape. 
So these are what some of the time series look like. So this, you know, the background map is a trend map. And so here we're looking at the ups and downs or in California. And each one of those dots is a month. Uh, so we're looking at wet season, dry season, wet season, dry season, sort of the first phase of the drought, second phase of the drought in recent years. So 2006 to 2010, 2011 to 2016. And then, you know, we might be over here somewhere, but the long-term picture is one of sort of stepping stepping down, mainly as the groundwater disappears. Um, I won't talk as much about the High Plains Aquifer today, but John mentioned something about what, like 50 years to 50%. And, you know, Dave Heidman has been writing papers saying that, you know, the water will be gone and he's at Michigan State, water will be gone in 30 years. So that's a, that's a regional decision, right? They're, they're heading in that, uh, in that direction. So this is a huge concern. Um, you know, if we go back and look at this map, one of the things that I don't have enough an opportunity to say is that, you know, there's good news and bad news here. And so the good news is the United States is a big country. And like you were saying about Texas, you know, it's a big state. And so we've got some wet places and some dry places. We've got some aquifers and, you know, we can say the same thing about California. So we have the opportunity to sort of work together. But we don't do that within a state. We don't do that within the country. But when you look at this map, it's obviously a national water problem, okay? And when we think about food and how places like the High Plains and, and the Texas Panhandle and Eastern New Mexico and, and uh, the Central Valley in California grow food for the nation using water that is just local water, this is a problem because that water is disappearing. So there's a food issue. I'm also on the Ag Board, by the way. So I'm on the parallel, some banner, the Board of Agricultural Natural Resources. Um, and so, you know, we need to be thinking about, are we going to be moving water to our major food producing regions in the United States, or are we going to be redistributing agriculture, right? So this is what, uh, this is what these data suggest. You heard John talk about managed depletion. You probably will never hear Max say that, right? He's smiling, but that's exactly what's happening. And his bosses will at least admit that to me in private, that sustainability is a bit of a misnomer, right? So this is what's, this is what's happening. Uh, okay, so there's some of the time series. Communicating this to the public is important. This is supposed to be moving. Let's see if it actually moves. There we go. So this is an animation. So, you know, getting the message out using visuals like this, you know, we're just gonna look at uh, the colors change and time series here uh, on the right and the corresponding animation on the left. And so we're gonna watch it get more and more red as we go into the first phase of the drought. Uh, then we're gonna to start to get a little recovery and the colors get more blue, right? Now we go to the really big bad drought of 2010 to 2016, then gets practically black, right? And then a little bit of recovery. And this is sort of when we stopped, that's when we made that, when we made that animation. <laughs> And so those sorts of graphics, I think, are super, you know, we're talking about media before. These sorts of things had a huge impact in California. There's a sort of a time slice that, uh, that's taken out of this animation of sort of beginning, middle, end, green, yellow, red, like traffic signal that really uh, made the rounds in California and had a pretty big impact. So how do we get to groundwater? from a time series like this. This is the California time series. Really, it's the Sacramento, San Joaquin, Tulare Basin time series of total water storage change. So how do we extract from this groundwater? Uh, Grace is telling us this, that the change in total water storage is equal to the change in snow, surface water, soil, moisture, groundwater. So Grace is telling us the change in this total basin here. If we want to, uh, this is the algebra part. Uh, if we want to solve for groundwater, then we can just rearrange the equation. We need to get these data from other places, right? So Grace gives us this, and if we want to isolate the blue part, the change in the groundwater, then we need to remove, right? Subtract that from the equation, remove, think of it as sort of removing the mass change signal. We need data. Um, and what data we use depends on where we are. And if we're uh, in California, we have lots of ground-based data. Right, we can use snow measurements, we can use reservoir data. We don't really do a great job measuring soil moisture yet. Uh, so we tend to rely on models. 
if we're someplace where we're not going to easily get our hands on data, like Syria, we'll rely more on models and other satellites. Um, within NASA, we're thinking about, sorry, wait a minute. Perhaps I left out yet another slide. Okay, so uh, I did have a slide, maybe I removed it, that will look at how we can do a lot of this from remote sensing, thinking about other uh, new snow uh, missions. And so Jared and I were just talking about the snow, uh, the future of snow uh, remote sensing over lunch. Surface water uh, hopefully will come from the SWAT mission, the surface water and ocean topography mission. Soil moisture we're already measuring uh, with the soil moisture active passive mission and the French SMOS mission. Um, so there's hope to be doing more of this large scale work from space. Uh, okay, so how do we do this in California? Uh, we're looking at the Central Valley, the green part, trying to get at what's happening with groundwater there. So we um, used SNODAS, which is a simulated snow uh, observations and a model from the Weather Service surface water. We use uh, measurements from um, uh, the California reservoirs, storage in the reservoirs and soil moisture. Again, we use uh, we used model soil moisture. And so we run through this and we get uh, a time series that looks like this. And so, you know, it looks like a bunch of gibberish, but really what it is, is actually quite important because this represents uh, an estimate of the change in groundwater storage from space over a large area that really isn't otherwise possible in, in, a, short, in a short time span. USGS does it, of course, takes a long time and a lot of manpower to do the very careful measurements that are required to really what's, uh, understand what's going on. This is more like uh, we're going through with a snow plow, okay? And we're, we're kind of taking a uh, first cut at, at what's going on. And so we see very distinctly the overall uh, decreasing trend and the, and the trends that, uh, during the last two phases of drought. What is the light colored one? Uncertainty. Yeah that's, the, yeah, that's the uncertainty that comes from doing a water balance. And, you know, we have to uh, account for the, the error in the grace and the error in the snow measurements, right? And so, so the whole propagated yes, snow yeah, snow. right. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's overly optimistic for sure. <laughs> Biggest source of error is really in the soil moisture, <clears throat> really, because we don't measure it and we're relying on models. And so we do the standard thing of what's the standard deviation of the models and their large area models. And, you know, the, the models themselves could be terrible. So we, you know, readily admit that uh, there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go here. But the big picture, nonetheless, is quite clear, right? And so this is the long-term cumulative groundwater loss that's been happening in the Central Valley going back to 1962. This is from, uh, based on Claudia Font's uh, uh, figure in the 2009 uh, professional, uh, professional paper. So what are we looking at? Red, USGS data. The blue is the estimate that we just that I just showed you, tacked onto the end here. So our grace-based estimate. Colors in the background. This is dark tan. Is drought, super dry. Blue, wet, right, wetter than usual. And the light tans and blues that don't show up as well are moderately dry, moderately wet. So take-home messages here: long-term decline of groundwater in the Central Valley, right? This is the, the downward trend. The other message is that we get some recovery in wet periods, but then we get an awful lot of depletion and some recovery and a lot of depletion. So the hope of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, so this is where sustainable becomes a little bit of a misnomer. There's really no way we're gonna level off that trend ever. We'd have to stop producing food and do all kinds of managed recharge. Agriculture uses a tremendous amount of water, but yet we need to eat. Uh, so I think the benefit, you know, one of the real benefits of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act will be to slow that rate of depletion. So take that trend line from something like this to, you know, of course, people that are listening can't see me move my arm up and down, but basically decrease the rate of disappearance, manage the rate of depletion. That will be agreed upon by a number of different groundwater sustainability agencies across the state. Good luck with that, Max. <laughs> oh, here's the slide I was trying to show you. So this is sort of the future. So we have the follow on now for Grace. Uh, we're hoping for ASO's Airborne Snow Observatory, which is uh, an airborne um, 
uh, operation that's run by my colleague Tom Painter. Now it's he's left, but uh, left it at, at JPL. So it does aircraft lidar measurements of snow and estimates snow water equivalent at very high resolution. Perhaps we'll get a snow uh, remote sensing mission based on this concept or other concepts. Uh, SWAT I mentioned and SMAP is sort of the future for soil moisture, uh, soil moisture and and uh, sorry surface water and soil moisture remote sensing. Uh, just an update on some new techniques. So you know when you look at our paper on India, which is one of the first big you know so the resolution of grace is very coarse. There's lots of room for improving it. This went into a proposal. Uh, how to improve things like the trend going from a blob like this in northwestern India to something with a lot more resolution in India and Pakistan. So we're going from basically the resolution of that blob is probably 150,000 square kilometers and this is uh, order of magnitude higher resolution. Same thing with the amplitude here looking in the Amazon by the amplitude I mean the peak to peak peak to trough uh, height on those time series and the amplitude is important because Bigger amplitude means stronger water cycle, more in, more out, more flood, more drought. Right. Never realized that rhymed until right now. <laughs> Subsidence, huge deal. Here's Joe Poland, famous USGS hydrogeologist standing next to a telephone pole in uh, the middle of the Central Valley in 1977 uh, with the previous ground heights marked on the telephone pole. Okay, so that's about 50 feet in 50 years. These are some slides from Tom Farr, who's at JPL, looking at this region in the box. Groundwater subsidence, like you know, many of you know what it is. It's kind of like deflation of a tire. When you let the air out of a tire, it flattens out. When you take the water out of some aquifers and some uh, uh, aquitards, because of the mineralogy, the flat clay minerals that are in some of those aquifers, they tend to flatten out. So they have to be aquifers that have clay minerals or, or aquitards. So here's some radar data from Tom from 2007 through 2011, looking around this Merced region. And so we've got eight to 10, you know, up to about a foot per year. Then in the real, real bad part of the drought, the last phase, the 2011 to 2015, we're up to a foot and a half per year. Update I got from Tom, the colors have shifted, but now we're up to a meter per year. Now we're sort of looking south of that. There's that region we were looking at. And now we're up to uh, a meter per year. So this is, this is ongoing. Uh, so this is an issue. So there's Joe in 77 and I Photoshopped him to go to 2015, right? So this is a problem. And it's happening all over the United States. So this is from another USGS report. So all these blue areas are places where subsidence has been been detected. Uh, Colorado River Basin um, is a place where, you know, we don't talk a lot about groundwater unless we're talking about Arizona. And this is a problem because the, the groundwater itself is really, really important to, uh, to the water security of the Western US and certainly to the lower Colorado River Basin. And because, you know, if there's less total water availability, then there's less opportunity to actually meet the demands, right, of the, of the basin state. So this is a paper we did back in 2014. Here's the GRACE signal for the total water storage change. So wet season, dry season, seasonal variations, but a trend. We want to look at where that trend was coming from and how much of it was groundwater versus how much is surface water. Because when we talk about the Colorado River Basin, we almost always talk about the river and Lake Mead and we never talk about the groundwater. So we wanted to see what was happening and that's down here. And get to the punchline, here's Lake Powell or Lake Mead, biggest reservoirs in the United States shown in red in this time period. You know, when you know, we know that they're dropping, but they're actually not dropping as much as the groundwater, which is largely unmanaged, and which is disappearing at a rate of about six to one, conservatively. Okay, so we're managing the groundwater, managing the surface water, groundwater is quietly disappearing. It's a global issue. Here's the global map. Um, so here's the ice sheets melting. There's the glaciers melting away. Here's some climate change, high latitude and low latitude increases, mid latitude drying. Here's some uh, interannual variations dropped in there. This is all in a paper that's published last year at this time. Uh, and here's the, here's the aquifers. 
I just just threw on there. Whoops. Uh, so these are our mid-latitude aquifers that are all being depleted. Um, and we can map those to an aquifer template, which we did in a paper in 2015 and show that over half of the world, so it's not just, not just US, over half of the world's major aquifers are, are being rapidly depleted. There's some of the time series. Uh, just a couple of things to think about. This was supposed to be, uh, not sure I'm gonna be able to show you what I want to. That was supposed to be an animation. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you know we move a lot of water around in California, right? And we're starting to talk about doing it in Saskatchewan. Actually, I'm going to a meeting on Monday. I'm going to show these slides uh, after I clean them up a little bit and make sure I deliver the right presentation because the guy who's in charge of the meeting is sort of the equivalent of our vice president. So I'll try to clean up my act. Uh, so we move a lot of water around in California, principally through the state projects, which are shown in red and the federal projects, which are shown in, in yellow. And there's allocations. And you know maybe Max is the guy who, who comes up with the number. I, I don't actually know, okay? What I've shown in this figure, the black line is that groundwater time series that we calculated before. The red and blue lines are the allocations in the state and federal water projects. How much surface water is available? And that's as a percent of some total number. And so those numbers during wet periods are higher, 80%, 90%, 100%. During a drought, we cut back on surface water allocations, right? 50%, 40, right? Down here is some of the projects where are zero, right? The Central Valley project, zero allocation. So this just gets to the issue of, are we really kidding? I mean, we're kind of kidding ourselves when we manage one and not the other. We manage surface water and not groundwater because all that happens here is that when surface water is not available, we use groundwater. Okay, and in this case, the depletion, right? The relationship between using more groundwater and having less surface water available is one to one. This is not rocket science, but I think it's an important graphic. And it really speaks to the need for combined surface and groundwater management. I'll finish up with this slide because it speaks to the, um, the renegotiation of the Colorado River Basin allocations, the drought contingency plan. And so Arizona is sort of at the end of the water rights. And within Arizona, the farmers are at the end of the line. Okay. And so what's happening is in Arizona is that if and when the drought contingency plan kicks in, then Arizona will lose a lot of water. And specifically, the farmers will lose a lot of water. It's already been agreed that the farmers can use groundwater. In fact, they're being subsidized to, to drill more wells. But I've already showed you that the groundwater is disappearing. Now, I just want to sort of juxtapose that with my experience in Phoenix. When you go to Phoenix, you will hear the Chamber of Commerce say, Phoenix is open, for, is there from Phoenix here? <laughs> Phoenix is open for business. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, buddy. Uh, you know, Phoenix is open for business. We have plenty of water and yes, Right, the city, I think if you're gonna build some new development or something, you need to show a hundred years of water availability. But that was before the drought contingency plan and now the future over reliance on groundwater. And so when the farmers, so Phoenix will say, we have about 300 years of groundwater left. That's before the drought contingency plan kicked in and gave farmers and are subsidizing farmers to use more groundwater and use it without management yet, okay? And so my point is maybe, that not, maybe now Phoenix only has 200 years or 150 years of groundwater left. And in a city like Phoenix, the disappearance of groundwater is the disappearance of the city, okay? So these decisions are being made and we're not even aware of it. Okay, so we need to really understand what's happening around us. Okay, so it's a good place for me to stop. Thank you. Uh, let's take one or two. We'll just push into the, um, so we got two questions here. So first and then Dave second. Okay. Can you distinguish between fresh water and salt yep. water? Okay. Hi, you should know me by now, Ingrid Padilla. <laughs> so, can you distinguish between fresh water and salt water uh, in coastal systems? 
No, no, without all, no. We're just seeing a mass change and the real work of unraveling, so that's the real work, is unraveling the signal. So we would need a lot of extra data. You mentioned innovation transfer in, in California. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, large scale uh, sensing you're able to do, uh, can, can you in your group quantify the impacts of interbasin water transfer? And Probably, but that, that would be modeling, right? That's a modeling scenario. And so there are right, lots of groups who could do that, what, and we're, we're doing some of it right these days in, in the Saskatchewan River Basin, but um, um, it's great for the two groups to interact, right? So you can sort of see what's happening and then use that as sort of initial conditions for, for modeling. You have you ever yeah. have you ever done a full scan of the earth and compared the box that is terrestrial water with the box that would be the ocean and do they match yeah yeah so yes they do and um so you know my my university colleagues will uh appreciate that there are some papers that you write and you've been trying to publish for years and years and years and, and they may never get published and so this is one but let me show you what happens with, with hand motion, okay? So what happens with the land is that it does this, and what happens with the ocean is that it's out of phase, right? So when, when water moves from the land, it goes to the ocean. When it moves from the ocean, it goes back to the land. So they match each other perfectly, but we can see the trends of like, basically the land storage going down as the ice melts and the ocean storage going up just because of, because of sea level rise. Someday that paper will be published I promise, but I can't predict when. Uh, it's, I've been predicting it for 10 years. That's great. We're going to stop now, but we're going to have time for more discussion afterwards. So I just want to be sure we have time for our next um, presentation. Um, and so uh, we were groundwater quality is uh, our next topic. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, <clears throat> speak with you. Uh, I'll do a little introduction so you know where I'm coming from. I started out as a groundwater modeler, and in fact, the uh, Central Valley Hydrologic Model that Jay referred to, I wrote that proposal as a project manager for that. I've also worked in California on a program called the Groundwater Ambient Monitoring Assessment Program. That was a very generous uh, sponsorship by the California Water Boards of $50 million to evaluate the quality of California's groundwater. And I'm proud of the fact that we finished that project under budget and ahead of schedule. Um, today I'll speak to you in my capacity as the National Water Quality Assessment Groundwater Studies Chief. Uh, we're undergoing a reorganization. I'm in the Earth System Processes Division um, of the Water Mission Area, but we, like a lot of organizations, have cross um, flowcharts. So my primary job responsibilities are to look at our groundwater studies. Is it just this arrow here? I'll divide my presentation up into three parts. I'll give you a little bit of background, then I'll show you some broad-based results, and then I'll focus on constituent-specific results. When I spoke with the staff before here, they asked me what keeps me up at night, and, and the answer is red wine. Um, but my goal is to keep you up at night with some of our findings. The National Water Quality Assessment Program was the outgrowth of a set of questions and some funding provided by the United States Congress. What is the condition of the nation's streams, rivers, and groundwater? How are these conditions changing over time? How do natural factors and human activities affect these conditions? And where are those effects most pronounced? We're operating in streams, we're looking at aquatic ecosystems, we're looking at groundwater. A little bit of a historical perspective, so you have some sense of where we have been and what we're up to. NOC operates on decadal scales. The first decade was 1991 to 2001. The primary organizational unit was the study unit. There were 51. It's no accident that there's one in each state. The USGS is not political, but they know where the senators are. And the goal of those study units was to provide a baseline survey of water quality conditions. From 2002 to 2012, the focus was to produce a set of synthesis reports on major water quality topics of national priority. <clears throat> we're now in our third decade. It was scheduled to go from 2013 to 2022. It will be sunset in 2021. Sandy spoke to you about our new work programs. The work being conducted by NOC when the funding that was going toward NOC will, will be incorporated into these new work programs. And I can speak faster because I'm from New York, so please do slow me down. 
Groundwater is an important source of water supply in the United States. And you'll notice I add a little subtitle, a drinking water perspective. 45% of the U.S. drinking supply comes from groundwater. If we divide that up, the shallower depth zones are used primarily for domestic supply. About 40 million people depend on groundwater for their domestic supply. And those wells are typically drilled at depths of 50 to 150 feet. Public supply wells provide water for about 100 million people. The depth zone for public supply is about 150 to 750 feet. Um, those slices are attempt to be proportional. So we're going to focus on groundwater as a drinking supply. Principal aquifers provide a framework for that assessment. In cycle one, decade one, the survey effort was focused on those study units, which are largely large watersheds. During cycle two, we made the transition. In decade three, we're focusing on principal aquifers. The USGS has mapped 62 principal aquifers in the, in the United States, 57 of which are in the conterminous US. If you take a closer look, 20 principal aquifers account for 90% of the pumping for public supply and 85% of the pumping for domestic supply. Two of those are located entirely in California, the Central Valley and California coastal basins. Those basins got covered as part of that groundwater ambient monitoring assessment program. So it leaves 18 principal aquifers for us to evaluate. And we are well on our way to completing that. NACWA has three types of studies that it has been engaged in over the past 20 plus years. There's a set of networks called land use studies. They're typically observation wells. They're typically drilled to depths of 20 to 50 feet. Where you see those green dots, those are wells drilled in agricultural areas, where you see those red dots in urban areas. We've been measuring water quality in those wells once every 10 years, so we're now into the third set of measurements. You'll notice that those studies are highly targeted. They're designed to ask the question, what is the effect of a specific land use on water quality? And trying to get to the shallowest first encounter with the water table. Built around those are what are now called major aquifer studies. They're typically domestic wells, but not entirely. These wells are about 50 to 150 feet deep. They're also targeted. They're not distributed across the entire resource. In, in that first decade, we were in large watersheds. The study unit staff chose an area inside that watershed where domestic wells were an important source of water. They distributed those wells within that area, and they conducted their studies. Those studies weren't really designed to get a the whole picture for the US. However, they are distributed across a really wide range of climate and hydrogeologic conditions. Now that we're into our third decade, we have these principal aquifer studies. They're almost entirely public supply wells. They're typically deep and they're distributed. The wells are distributed across an entire principal aquifer. It's not the only data sets that we have. We're sampling about 1,500 public supply wells. NACWA has sampled something on the order of 4,000 monitoring domestic wells. Of those, roughly, oh, maybe 1,500 continue to be resampled. The US Geological Survey has a, a set of water science centers. Those water science centers um, collaborate with local state agencies as part of the co-op program. All those data are assembled into our national water information system. So all those little dots that you see there is the location of a well in this National Water Information System. There are about 85,000 wells. Not all of them have water quality data. Most of them don't have an extensive suite as do the NACWA wells. There's also another set of water quality data out there, the US EPA Safe Drinking Water Information System, SIDWIS. There are 225,000 wells in that data set. Not all of them have water quality data. We've made extensive use of the NWIS data. We're now beginning to make use of the SIDWIS data. That's the background. Now let's look at some broad-based results. These results are for our major aquifer studies from that first decade. Leslie DeSimone and others wrote a circular. What you see here is simply a look at all the wells as a snapshot. And I want to make the important point that that set of wells is a set of wells. They may or may not be representative of the larger resource, but it's still a nice indicator. 20% of those two, 15% of those 2,000 wells have an exceedance of a health-based threshold for a geologic sourced material. 5% have an exceedance for a man-made. So just in the big picture, geologic sources are generating more concentrations above a health-based threshold than man-made. 
the, the top three geologically were manganese, arsenic, and radon. Not all trace elements, not all radiochemical constituents were sampled for all these wells. The man-made sources, nitrate, 4%. Pesticides and solvents are very rarely detected at high concentrations. It doesn't mean if you're living next to one, it's not a problem for you. It's not to say that a leaky tank isn't a problem for everybody, but leaky tanks are not everywhere over the landscape. Even nitrate is not everywhere on the landscape. Agriculture is not 100% of the landscape. California, a really important agricultural state, about 12% of the landscape is agricultural. So those are the results from our domestic wells. This is, I feel like, the commercial results at regional and PA scales can differ. Let's switch to these principal aquifer surveys. We have sampled over 1,200 wells to date. We sample from more than 500 constituents in every one of those wells. 34 trace elements, major and minor ions, eight radioactive constituents, 90 VOCs. The 90 VOCs is the same as we did in the previous cycles, if we sample the VOCs at all. We're sampling for 227 pesticides and their degradates. Previously, we were sampling, I think, for about 120. The increase in numbers largely looking for the degradates. Added to the cycle were 120 pharmaceuticals and hormones. I've got those slides at the, after my presentation, should there be time. We also sample extensively for traces of groundwater age. Tritium, helium, other noble gases, carbon-14, SF6, CFCs. Every single well. It's a kind of data that's not otherwise available. So the survey is trying to add to that national data set. SIDWIS routinely collects for regulated constituents. People are not required to sample for age tracers. Of all those 500 constituents, 182 have a human health benchmark. Not all human health benchmarks are regulatory. Those are maximum contaminant levels, but there are health-based thresholds that can be used to provide context. So here's how we provide context. We take the environmental concentration, we put it in the numerator, we put the, we put the health-based threshold in a denominator, and we get a ratio. If the concentration is greater than the benchmark, then that relative value is more than one, we'll call that a high value. If a value is greater than one-tenth the benchmark and less than one, we'll call it moderate for organics. If it's less than half the benchmark, if it's greater than one-half the benchmark and, and less than one, we call it moderate for inorganics. We have different thresholds for organics and inorganics because organic constituents are added by people. People are really sensitive to the presence of pesticide and VOCs in their water. If you tell them that you have a little bit of manganese or a little bit of nitrate, it doesn't have the same effect. So we're giving the organic constituents an opportunity to present themselves in this approach. Proportion is really good because it is scale invariant. I can talk about what proportion of the state of New Jersey has high concentrations or what proportion of the state of Texas has high proportions. The precision of that estimate does not depend upon the size of the place. The precision of that estimate depends on the number of samples you obtain. We have routinely sampled for 60 wells distributed across the principal aquifer. If a constituent is present in 2% of the resource, we have a 90% chance of finding it. So we're not going to miss much. So let's take our prelim preliminary results at the highest level. We're just going to take all the wells. We won't worry about how big those aquifers are. We won't worry about how much groundwater pumping comes from them, just the, at the, the well review scale. Inorganic constituents are present at high concentrations in roughly 25% of the resource, of the well sampled. The low values are roughly half. The organics, I think there was one value that was high in 1,300 wells distributed across the landscape. And you can see it's a very small sliver from moderate concentrations. So inorganic constituents are more prevalent at high concentrations than organic constituents. Let's break open those pie charts. And what's nice about the pie charts is you can ask the question of a well, is this well high for inorganics? Yes or no? It's just a one or a zero, assemble up the results. You can ask, is it high for trace elements? You can ask, is it high mm -hmm. for arsenic? So when we break it out this way, trace elements and radioactivity are those constituents most prevalent at high concentrations on the order of 10 to 15 percent. I'll telegraph a little bit. The trace elements typically are in classic aquifers. The radioactivity is typically high in carbonate aquifers, but not always the case. 
And then you look at nitrate, great cause of concern because of eutrophication, but at the depth zone used for public supply, nitrate concentrations are high in about 1% of these wells. VOCs and pesticides, one detection. If you look at a pesticide compound and you ask the question, what is the highest concentration that this pesticide was detected at? Put that in the numerator. Into the denominator, put the health-based threshold. The typical number for these compounds is on the order of 1.001, like 1 1,000th. One they're ubiquitously present, but they're ubiquitously present at very low concentrations relative to human health benchmarks. If you're a fish or an insect, it could be a, a different outcome. So that's a big picture. Let's look at what these constituents are. So this is the answer, what keeps you up at night? These are a list of constituents that should be candidates. <clears throat> radium-226 plus radium-228 is very rarely measured for. It's measured for when gross alpha um, dictates that they do so. In those 1,300 wells, it's a 5% exceedance rate. Arsenic, 5%, manganese, 4%. Strontium-3, radon-2, uranium-1, fluoride-1, nitrate-1. So taking nitrate as our benchmark, we know it's a concern. People are worried about it. Everything in this list above nitrate ought to be on your list also. And molybdenum is not much below nitrate. And then that right-hand column, all but nitrate are coming from rocks and minerals. At the risk of sounding silly, rocks and minerals are everywhere. The sources of nitrate are not. That's why we find naturally sourced contaminants to be the most prevalent. It's just that simple. I'll back up. I didn't put gross alpha and gross beta in this list. They are regulated constituents, but they are sort of, you know, bins for a number of components. So I didn't isolate those out. All that data is published in data series reports. From the date we sample a well to the time you see that report, about three years or so, maybe two if we're lucky. Accompanying those data reports or a set of fact sheets. Every one of these principal offers gets a nice fact sheet. The kinds of pie charts that you just saw are in these fact sheets. The map up in the right, up right hand corner shows 15 of our principal aquifer surveys. 11 of those fact sheets are published, four mm -hmm. are just about published. And I'll walk you through those. And as again, as a reminder, each one of those principal aquifers was divided into equal area cells. It's called stratified random sampling. It's not random sampling. And it's stratified because we're dividing the aquifer up into cells of equal area. That leads to a dispersed set of points. It would fail any test of randomness that you would apply to it because it's dispersed. This provides a direct assessment of the resource. That set of wells is in fact a stand-in for the resource. So let's walk through this slowly. I'll put some boxes around some of these pie charts and then I'll add some. The ones shown in purple are carbonate aquifers. Let's start with the Ozarks. Less than 25% of the resource has high or moderate concentrations, about 75% low. We go to the Biscayne, about the same, although more moderate than Ozarks. The Florida is slightly more than a quarter, and then the Valley and Ridge, a bit more, again, more. We often think of carbonates as being really vulnerable. Well, they are vulnerable where they're unconfined, and there's been a lot of study of karst aquifers and therefore, a lot of folks have the sense that all carbonate aquifers must have problems. Carbonate aquifers have problems in those areas where they're unconfined, but once they're confined, it's not nearly the same issue. Let's compare that to unconsolidated deposits. High plains and glacial, the high plains, that blue north to south color, the glacial is the crosshatch across the northern tier of the country. Basin range filled largely, but not entirely Nevada, and then the Rio Grande Valley. In every one of those cases, the high plus moderate concentrations are more than half the resource. In each case, the high values are about a quarter of the resource. The unconsolidated deposit aquifers have a lower water quality than the carbonate aquifers do on the whole. So again, there's been a lot of focus on carbonate systems because of their, their variability but they're sort of the big picture. Let's switch back to this picture of our carbonates. And now let's compare those carbonate aquifers to buried sand, consolidated sands and sandstone aquifer systems. These systems are all pointing from the land surface out down beneath the ocean. So they're increasingly confined as you move from their outcrop 
towards the offshore. The Mississippi embayment and Texas coastal uplands are shown in yellow. The U.S. Geological Survey separates the Mississippi embayment from the Texas coastal uplands, but it's a state boundary. So when we hear about those aquifers being in the state, it's partly by definition. If it's in Texas, it is an aquifer. I was just getting right digging. I apologize. Um, and what we can see there is that the water quality is about the same as the Ozarks. The coastal lowlands shown in that pink purple color, it's about the same as the Florida. The North Atlantic coastal plain shown in the mustard color, the southeastern coastal plain shown in that maroon red color, the water quality is comparable to somewhere between the Biscayne and the Florida. Highly confined systems generally are protected from the overlying landscape, much less prone to superficial contamination. Um, and because of the nature of the lithologies, they're not that prone in most cases to the geologic constituents as well. There's the Canberra Ordovician, which we'll focus on next. Half the resource has high concentrations. So we're gonna go now from the broad base to the constituents base. This slide has a lot of information on it. I took it out of a publication by one of my colleagues. I'll add a set of squares so that way you can walk through it slowly with me. The Canberra Division system is a buried system. It sits in the northern Midwest. We have 60 public supply wells, one well per cell. Those are the stratified randomized sampling design that we use. Then we also have 20 additional public supply wells that were targeted to areas with high gross alpha activity. This was a collaboration with the Minnesota Department of Health and others. Those understanding wells are shown with circles drawn around them. Now, you'll see there's an area of gray and there's an area of white on that map. That area of gray is where the Makokita shale sits above the Canberra Ordovician and where it's white, that shale is absent. So we have the shale overlying the Canberra Ordovician aquifer in part and absent in part. Let's look at the mean groundwater age. So we have extensive age sampling. So it's going to be the shapes of those symbols. Where you see a circle, you have groundwater that's less than 10,000 years old. So the national water model is interested in time scales from days to a couple of months. We're he operating here, the young groundwater is less than 10,000 years old. If you look at those triangles, that's groundwater more than 100,000 years old. And in fact, some of those wells, the groundwater is more than a million years old some of the oldest groundwater that we've actually ever dated. So that is the mean groundwater age. And you'll notice that the older groundwater tends to be beneath that shale, the younger groundwater tends to be northeast of that shale. Now finally, with that background information, let's take a look at concentrations. The gray fills shapes are concentrations that are um, one half of the benchmark. The green values are between one half and the benchmark, and those red-brown colors are above the benchmark. If you look, you'll see there's a lot of red in that gray area, there's a lot of gray in that white area. Well, let's summarize that here. The upper pie chart shows what proportion of all the samples in that unconfined region have high concentrations, moderate and low. One quarter is high, two thirds is low. If we look at the pie chart where the Makokita shale is present, more than half of those samples have high concentrations for radium-226 plus 228. The groundwater flow is generally from northwest to southeast. As the water moves along that flow path, particularly as it moves beneath the shale, we get increased mineralization and increasingly reduced conditions. Radium-226 is sorbed onto iron hydroxide coatings under oxic conditions. As that water begins to get reduced, as the salinity as it goes up, then we get mobilization due to decreased sorption capacity and increased competitive exchange. So the radon-226 is simply being released to the aquifer system under those conditions. So if radium doesn't have you worried, I'll try to worry you with potentially corrosive groundwater. The Geological survey was approached going back now about five years or four years, wanting to know whether or not there was any information on lead. And we don't have a lot of lead because we sample water before it enters the home. We sample it at the wellhead. Lead, when it's present in household water, is typically present because it's leached from the household components. 
or in the case of large utilities, it could be from, from the mains delivering water to homes. We had 27,000 wells in our NWIS data set where we could compute the Langular Saturation Index, which is essentially a carbonate cal a calcite saturation index, and the chloride to sulfate mass ratio. The Langular Saturation Index is a calcite saturation index. It's sort of a proxy for any carbonate precipitate. The chloride to sulfate mass ratio is important because when it's high and you have lead, then you can, and you have lead in contact with other metals, you can get corrosion. So we computed the LSI and the chloride to sulfate mass ratio at each one of those 27,000 locations, classified it out, and then looked at the prevalence of corrosive values on a statewide basis. Those states that are colored in darker orange are states where half the wells have corrosive groundwater. The ones coded in the lighter orange color, I think it was um, like a quarter to half, the green less so, and then the lightest color still less so. Eight million people live in states where most of the groundwater is corrosive or potentially corrosive. So if there's lead in the piping, if there's lead in the fixtures, if there's lead solder at those copper fittings, then there's that potential. There are 60 million people living in those lighter orange colored states. This to me is always a cause for more work is needed. That clearly people ought to be getting their homes tested in those states. The green states and the lighter green colors doesn't mean people are free. There's still corrosive groundwater, but it's not as prevalent. Well, the LSI is not a particularly satisfying um, value to use because it doesn't directly speak to lead. Um, Brian Jurgens and others put together a paper. We published in ESMT. We repeated our exercise for 8,000 supply wells from our NWIS data set. And we geochemically speciated, or rather using a code, we speciated, you know, we kept add, we titrated lead into the solution geochemically, or I should say numerically, until precipitates formed. And those color codes reflect how much lead that water would absorb before the first instance of the precipitate. And those reds and the greens are the places where a lot of lead is added to the water. Perfect. Just about done. Um, so you can see that those greens and reds correspond reasonably closely. Manganese has a secondary maximum contaminant level of 50. It has a health pain screening level of 300. These show 43,000 wells in our NWIS data set. Everything in gray is less than 300. Everything colored is more than 300. 13% of our samples have manganese greater than 300. I'll just kind of cut to the punchline. When you look at the conditions under which manganese is high and you ask how many people depend on supply wells in those areas, it's about 2.6 million people. I'll skip over uranium, just a time. Let's talk about nitrate, something that I was told people uh, very much care about here. Shown on this map are the centroids of our networks, our land use networks, and our major aquifer survey networks. Our land use networks are shallow wells. The circles are agricultural. The squares are urban. The, di the triangles are major aquifers, largely domestic wells. Let's look at the colors. Where the color is clear, it means there were no exceedances at all in that network. Where you see yellows, it means that there were detections and less than 20% of the wells in that network had a high value. Where you see red, it means that 20% or more of the wells in that network had high values. So this is um, Neil Dabrowski's attempt to take measurements at thousands of wells and cascade them up. So let's just try to pull this together into a summary. The agricultural wells shown in circles 40% of the agricultural networks are characterized by the fact that 20% of the wells have high values for nitrate. So if you're at a shallow monitoring well in an agricultural area, 20% or more of the well, 20% or more of the wells are high 40% of the time. Go to the other end, major aquifer surveys, largely domestic wells. 5% of all those networks have, you know, maybe two, you know, one to two wells of a high nitrate concentration. 
I threw this slide in, so I'll use the last minute for this. I've heard a lot about machine learning. We are using machine learning fairly extensively. As part of our NOCLA program, we have four intensively studied principal aquifers, Central Valley, Glacial, North Atlantic Coastal Plain, Mississippi Embayment. These show the outcomes from two machine learning models that we've built. The one in brown is nitrate, and those nitrate predictions are fully 3D. And it's the, prop, it's the, it's the concentration of nitrate in a voxel, we'll call it. So the darkest browns are more than 10, the lightest color less than two. The model predictors include dissolved oxygen, manganese, groundwater age, and other predictors. Up on the up left-hand corner are groundwater ages. Those come out of that Central Valley hydrologic model that you saw referenced before. So we're taking the simulation model results, we're feeding into machine learning code. The dissolved oxygen probability map, manganese is a redox indicator also. Those are determined using the same machine learning methods. We take the data, we train the machine learning model, fill those voxels with redox conditions, feed those results to the nitrate. In addition to doing these synoptic surveys, we're also tracking trends. We have a website, dot where you see an upward arrow, you see a statistically significant change in a network, where you see a black square, no statistical significance to the <clears throat> values, where you see a green, a statistically significant downward trend, where you see the large arrows, the change is more than 0.5 milligrams per liter at the median level. So the relatively small changes over a 10 year period. I think I finished just in time. <laughs> uh, so a couple questions and then we'll have both members of the panel um, go up for the follow ending discussion if that's okay. So um, I've got John and then Nusha. Oh, I'm sorry, David and then Nusha. And then after that, we'll go to the full panel. <sighs> How about waiting for the panel? Okay. All right. What, who did I say first? Yeah. Yes, John. On your prior slide, at, at what scale <clears throat> do you advise people to, to take that in and make something of it? Because I can imagine someone looking at my state going, oh, good, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very tough question. What's not turned on here is the network. So as you zoom in, it shows where the wells are. So you can get down to the level of looking at a set of wells, and you can see that that set of wells doesn't cover your whole state. I don't think we have a disclaimer that says that here's where we've sampled, we didn't sample elsewhere, therefore caution should be exercised in extrapolating. But you can, and you can download the data through this website. David. Thanks, Ken. Very interesting presentation. Um, my question relates to the fact that I believe you said the NACO program is sunsetting in 2021. Yes. Clearly, it looks like you've met the intent of Congress to do what exactly Congress said, is capture what the water quality is across our nation. Water quality has emerged, groundwater water quality has emerged as a very significant issue across the country, whether it's, you know, wherever. It's just Central Valley or Colorado River Valley or wherever. Um, it's an issue. Is it is the NACWA program going to be replaced by another program to carry on the legacy? Or will it indeed be sunsetted and left to float? I would say that's above my pay grade, but it might not be above Sandy's pay grade. Uh, um, that's that's what I was speaking to this morning. We're rolling our water quality assessments and our water availability assessments together into these integrated water um, availability assessments. So we are continuing um, our water quality assessment work. Um, it will not be called NAQA. But the sampling and, and, and will be you know continuing so we can still monitor the and track those changes. But we will be looking at water availability in terms of the quantity and the quality, so we're integrating that effort. Okay. 
And at the end of every 10 year, every decade of NACWA, we redesign the program anyway, so this is a natural uh, time to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, and I'm sorry that I missed part of your talk, but uh, my question is- It was little... the best part, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, I, actually, my question is a little bit slightly shifting from nitrate and sort of focusing on some of the organic or metal or other kind of pollutions that actually uh, we are dealing with in California as well, especially in urban areas, for example, dry cleaners and the, the concentration of PCEs and TCEs. Mm -hmm. and, and I was, I almost failed in chemistry, so if I'm making a mistake, I apologize. Um, but you know these are like serious uh, concerns, and um, and they are actually ubiquitous around the country and actually uh, in different parts of the world. I'm wondering if there is any focus on that or yeah, you know, doing anything. I can answer that because the groundwater ambient monitoring assessment program was implemented in California more intensively than what we're doing nationwide, and we looked at every public supply well in in the state. And when you look at the aerial resource for California, organic contaminants of any type are present in 0.5% of the aquifer system. If, however, you look at where they are and you weight those occurrences by the number of people depending on groundwater, then about 5% of the groundwater has high concentrations for any organic contaminant. The top organics for TCE, PCE, and DBCP, because DBCP was used as a fumigant in the eastern San Joaquin Valley. Again, if you focus in a little bit more, the San Fernando and San Gabriel Valleys have extensive TCE and PCE plumes due largely to aircraft cleaning operations during World War II. Those basins are um, in a situation where a very large number of wells are just on permanent treatment. So they put them through um, treatment towers. I think in part the perception about organic contamination being of the level of concern is because they occur in population centers that have political representation. And so when a community clearly experiences a problem like that, like lots of people in one place, the newspaper is headquartered there, the legislators are headquartered there. So yes, it's a problem, but in terms of say prevalence, um, nitrate, as an example, is present in about 5% of California's resource at high concentrations. And when you population correct it, it's about 5%. Um, I actually want to say, so I'm on the, on the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and actually my exposure to this topic has not been through media, actually through the cases that comes in front of us day in and day out. Sure. And population that complains about the fact that they have a high rate of cancer because there had been a, uh, you know, leakage from the, uh, you know, the dry cleaner in their area. Mm -hmm. We actually deal with a lot of disputes over who should pay for cleanup. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to sort of, um, all these people hired consultants to uh, figure out where the plume is going and how it's mm -hmm. moving. Um, so I, I would say, um, the biggest issue, however, is that some of these uh, water, the wells that are used for water supply by different groups, they depend mm -hmm. on deep groundwater, mm -hmm. um, while we are moving more and more toward, uh, you know, overusing those. So mm -hmm. this shallow groundwater is becoming a valuable source that we are going to start looking at. And what does that mean if we are, have not been... Um, Sort of uh, dealing with our industrial waste the way we should have been. Statement, yeah. but I didn't mean. To. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take that out as a segue to our panel, and our um, our first question is already lined up. So, if the panel could both join um, the just sit in the front. So, actually, I want to, if I may. Sure. Well, okay. So I I had a um, comment question for Ken. Um, the question is how much leveraging NACWA it's having with the toxic program at the USGS because the toxic program is looking at biomarkers in terms of health impacts and they are looking in water supply, uh, not just groundwater. So that is 
going to be the question. And then on the comment is, um, it's, it's a caution. Um, there's a lot of work in which uh, indicates that uh, the fact that you're not above MCL does not mean that you don't have an, a health impact. The other thing that we are finding, and your data shows it, the USGS data shows it, is that when you have organics, you actually have multiple mixtures of organics. And the impact of multiple species we don't yet understand what that is on the health, but biomarkers tend to indicate that the impact is really high. So using these indexes, I think we have to be very careful in, in putting people in a safe mode that we may not be with the organics. Um, I'm not sure if I'm being clear in what I'm saying, but yeah, one is a it's yeah. a concern on 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 the data that it's being presented. Into is that I think even data from the USGS is showing the health impact of these organics, even though they are at the nanograms per liter concentration. You know, the first part of your question about the relationship with the toxics program. Um, you know, before we had the reorganization. We have a national research program where people are doing work that's largely investigator driven. The toxics program incentivized those researchers to, to do work and would organize locations for people to do that work. The NAWQA program then when those methods are well developed, the NAWQA program could pick it up and institutionalize it. So a good example are the pharmaceutical compounds. The toxics program working with a couple of folks at the national lab developed methods for, for analyzing for a long list of, of pharmaceutical compounds. That, that I'm pretty sure that that paper that got published in the ESMT still might be the number one paper that got citations. Once that methodology was well developed, NAWQA could take that method and just routinely sample for it. So those biomarker methods have not yet made it to the national laboratories of schedule. And so the NAWQA typically could pick up the work at that point. Um, so that's just with respect to toxic. So toxic has been a leader in a sense, you know, that they identify a, a fruitful way of working so that a production operation like NAWQA can, can follow up. The second part of the question, I don't want to suggest that organics aren't a problem. There's a long list of constituents that we know to be above the health-based thresholds and yet aren't receiving the kind of attention that perhaps they ought to. And manganese would be one of those, which is a neurotoxin and doesn't have a regulatory threshold. So I'm trying to call attention to those things that we know they're high. We're not even debating about hmm. the effects of lower concentrations. It's been settled and yet we're not doing much about it. Thank you. I see Mark and I saw uh, an another hand in the back. Sorry, I don't know. You're yeah, Rich. Rich. Uh, Dave, Dave, Nusha. And I was surprised I didn't see. I surprised I didn't see uh, hexane chromium. Did that show up on your list? We've sampled for um, hexane chromium in the, several of our arid places. Um, it's high in a few places in California that we've published on. So again, it's not one of those things that's prevalent. Um, mm -hmm. You have to have the right source rocks and then the right redox conditions for it to be showing up at those depth zones. Okay, so it wasn't in your top whatever five, ten list. Because yeah, monitoring, we, we did it, it's American water in our ground. Um, highest was Arizona. Uh, luckily, we sold those wells, um, and then California. So pretty much in the same areas as arsenic. So I was surprised I didn't see that. Now you said you started. Um, you had some slides on pharmaceuticals. If you had any time, can you give us the um, bottom line, or we want to we, we throw up I can one describe or two it. of that? Um, so what what did you find on the in, in the wells and the pharmaceuticals? Um, the public supply wells, which are really well distributed, the detection rate for any pharmaceutical or hormone compound was about 6%. We sampled for 120 
compounds. I remember. I don't remember the breakdown between hormones and pharmaceuticals. There was one detection of a pharmaceutical compound above a health based threshold. There, the after that, none of the detections were even sort of one tenth the benchmark. So the, the detections are typically very low. If you look at the kinds of settings, the crystalline rocks, which have very low porosity, had the highest detection rates. Old groundwater had very low detection rates, but not zero. Younger groundwater had higher detection rates. Shallower wells, more detections than deeper wells. Then if you look at the KOC or the KOW, it's not fully predictive. You know, if a larger proportion of the wells that are highly soluble or don't strongly sorb got detected, but it wasn't a clear story that like, just cause it has a low solub, just cause it has a low solubility and a high sorptivity doesn't mean it didn't get detected in groundwater. There was no correlation with use. When you look at just poundages, so that, that would be the bottom line in that. Dave Wagner, I think. Oh. This is for Jay. I remember when you first brought, you and your students started coming to the Hill to educate us, and that was very helpful because for the first time, we could see the, tr the data trends and what was happening to groundwater supplies in the Central Valley, in particular, Colorado River Basin, et cetera. My question is, is that, I, I know you perhaps haven't done it, but your colleagues have looked at this from a global perspective. One of the big areas, and I was just in China last November, looking at groundwater development, shall you say, so we say, in China is related primarily to agriculture and municipal industrial efforts. To me, it seems that because of the role of groundwater in water security, and I think, in fact, you mentioned that, that we should be focusing on investments in helping to, I don't call it sustainability, but managed use of groundwater in these areas. To your knowledge, here's the question finally. Uh, to your knowledge, are is the State Department, World Bank, OECD, other financial institutions taking the data and looking at it in respect to water investments? Um, yeah, I, I think, but not on any, yes. Um, and so I visited with both uh, in the last year, uh, World Bank and, and uh, um, the Latin American Development Bank, and um, not in any comprehensive way. Um, and this is um, a little bit scary. I think a, maybe a, a good example for that is just looking at the African continent as a whole. Um, when we look at the GRACE data, we don't see a lot of, you know, you would think, oh, it's Africa, you know, there's no water. Well, it's actually a fair amount of groundwater and it's mostly undeveloped, right? It's not a very heavily populated continent. Um, and But yet we're seeing other countries like China uh, and Saudi Arabia move in there, right, develop. Um, so they're developing the groundwater resources for themselves. Uh, so uh, these are just things we, we have to walk, watch out for. Um, what's happening in China, there's some real hotspots, right, that show up globally. It's certainly the... Um, uh, the North China Plain and the Chan Chan uh, region are both super agricultural regions and they're big red hotspots on our, on our global maps. Uh, it's a tougher place. So China's a tougher place to work with, you know, for, for various reasons. Um, so anyway, lots of work to be done. Most of it is piecemeal. One of the reasons why I moved to Saskatchewan is to try to uh, provide some global vision. On, on these issues. And so any input on that, I appreciate it. Thanks, and I missed Richard. I was, I'm sorry, then we'll go back. Jay, uh, your GRACE data in the mid-Atlantic down to Florida coast, specifically along the coastline, you showed a positive increase of water. You think that's just an artifact of sea level rise because of the granularity of the data? No. There's no I recharge there. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I still have to look at it a little bit more closely. Um, Whenever you look at a narrow region, it is a little it gets a little bit trickier because it's hard to filter out the the ocean signal, and 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 so so okay so I retract what I said. It actually could be maybe not sea level rise, but it's just sort of we call it aliasing. So it's it's including some of that. Um, 
And so if we really wanted to get the answer, we'd have to do some special processing and make estimates for things like sea level rise and sort of correct that and see and see what's going on. Thanks. Dave, it's on back. For both, uh, for both of our speakers, uh, very informative talks and a lot to think about. Since we have some uh, high-level state representatives in the room, uh, I, I my question is, uh, about whether we, the information you've presented on water quality, you presented, Jay, on, on uh, available groundwater resources, uh, is it at an actionable level? Or to turn that around maybe to the state folks, uh, uh, how, how will this inform state actions? What, what kind of further development is needed to take this kind of information uh, to help with uh, decision making, with regulatory decision making, local decision making, is it enough for action? It seems pretty specific. I just wonder what the not to put uh, John and Max on the spot, or John or anybody else, but uh, would uh, like the state view of uh, utility. Um, well, I can. I mean, in terms of the grace data and the trends that that those data were showing. I think we're seeing that. I mean, we at a more granular level, we've got an extensive network of monitor wells that are showing exactly what it describes, but in more at a higher level of resolution. So uh, I, I think we're getting that information already. It's useful to see the trends, and I think worldwide it's it's informative. Um, but that that would, didn't really tell us much that we didn't already know. No offense, I'm not saying there's no value in that in that information. And in terms of the the uh, groundwater quality side of things, similarly. Um, I noticed that there was an uptick in nitrate showing up in Central Texas, and I know that area very well. Uh, I used to work at the Barton Springs segment uh, on the Barton Springs segment of the Edwards Aquifer, and the city of Austin is all over that. And they've got very extensive monitoring that they've got very extensive mitigation programs for endangered species and how to manage them. So I think it's useful information, but. Um, my personal uh, familiarity with some of what we saw is that those folks are aware of it. It's useful and that they've perhaps that showed them something they didn't know before, but they were able to uh, dig in on a deeper level to address the, the issue. Yes, I, I mean, I think it, it was actionable in helping our legislature um, develop our groundwater management law, which, which Jay alluded to, um, and it, it continues to be actionable in terms of um, maintaining pressure on both the state and local agencies to live up to the, the commitments they made, whether that actually means sustainability as we conceive of it, or, or some lesser level of uh, management, uh, it, but yes. So if I if I may follow up on that, uh, so thanks, Max. I appreciate that. But I've heard, and and I've heard that before. And so I think uh, one of the great success stories of the work that we've done with Grace is at a higher level, and uh, and so at the state level, California is a big state, so at state level and at the national level, because that's what it's good for. It's showing you that picture, and we did a lot of communication uh, based around, and you know, not just me, everyone. So we were talking about media this morning. There was an intensive focus. Uh, on what was happening in California. And, and my work and other work really contributed to that and getting the message across. So, I mean, hopefully right, we all know, right, if we're water managers in Texas or California, yeah, we know that the depletion is happening, but we need to convey that to the public so that they'll vote for it. So that, right, the pressure or, you know, we're giving the governor some cover to go ahead and, and, do, and do some things, right? So when people saw, um, you know, some of the, in particular, some of that great stuff, uh, whether it was papers or these, you know, images that I was talking about, uh, those were actionable at the higher level, right? At sort of a governor and a, you know, it certainly at a national level, but we don't really have any national policy. Okay, we have um, three questions queued up, two in the room and one online. Um, and so we're not going to take any more, but and we'll take a break. So Nusha, then um, Carl, and um, then it's online. Thank you. And 
Jay, one thing actually, I think this sort of lines up with a question that Dave asked. I think this all adds up to environmental governance or gover the governance as a general format, right? So it can help us to govern our natural resources better, provide funding, um, you know, legislation, regulations that are very important, valuable, and then local uh, you know, actors can decide how they want to take that to the next level. So I think that um, that was very important. One one thing I want to ask you, maybe two things. One is the new grace that's going up. Is the specifics of the satellite any? There's any difference between the temporal and special resolution? And then the second thing is, what do you think the role of these other sort of uh, tools, for example, drones or NSAR or some of the other um, other uh, high resolution data gather. Um, <clears throat> the GRACE follow on mission is basically a carbon copy of the original mission. It's called a, a climate continuation mission. Um, there is an experimental, you know, I mentioned how the satellites are basically measuring the relative position. You know, there's a, uh, an experimental uh, uh, laser system on there compared to a, a microwave system uh, in, in the original GRACE, but it it won't really increase the increase the resolution, uh, but I did show you some other research. You know, lots of people are working on downscaling, ingesting in models, and all that. But the mission is basically the same uh, carbon copy mission. Uh, I spoke so much, I already forgot the second question. What was it? <laughs> the role of these other. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think that there is. So in terms of uh, enhancing resolution, I think there's great opportunities to combine GPS and INSAR, uh, so uh, uh, interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar. Uh, lots of work needs to be done, uh, but there's lots of promise there, and there'll be areas and times. And and that also that's where I think maybe some data analytics and machine learning can can help us out quite a bit. Uh, the actual physical processes are super complicated because there's all the reflections from the radar, but there may be some sort of macro things we can get out of uh, uh, data analytics. So lots of lots of potential and a lot of ongoing research there. So Ken, I wanted to follow up a point that I, uh, I think Nusha sort of brought up in my mind. I I have no doubt, you know, that these deeper aquifers with thousands of years are, you know, your, your data looks pretty good, but there's a significant um, part of the population that gets, that gets water from private wells that are, you know, have, have issues. They don't have good, um, uh, you know, casings that block off the shallow from the upper. And I was reminded of some work that we did a number of years ago on uh, agrochemicals and drinking water. And the incredible data set for the, what's called the AMP, the Atrazine Monitoring Program. And that was by, I, I, I think there are some legal reasons why they had to sample in these particular locations, but they sampled them intensively. And what we found is that the sensitive populations, in our case, we were looking at, uh, so when, um, uh, I think it's the three months before a baby is born. What is the mother drinking? And it turns out that um, I, I, I found my old slide. I, I called it Aries Taurus babies. Um, they're actually exposed to one tenth during the important gestational periods. They're exposed to one tenth the exposure of atrazine than babies born at different times of the year because the mother is drinking water that is 10 times more uh, uh, higher levels of atrazine. Now, atrazine is applied at different times of the year in the same way that we see in, our, uh, in, in all kinds of work that nitrate levels go up and down throughout the year. Do you have any um, data that is of sufficient resolution temporally to be able to capture that intra-year variability? No, because the... <clears throat> You know, speaking to say the domestic wells, those wells, when they're sampled, they're sampled once every 10 years for the full suite. Um, but to speak to that point, 13, there were 2,000 domestic wells. The geogenic sources were 15%. The man-made sources were 5%. So 5% is a lot, but it's not as much as 15. And when you look at that 5%, 4% is nitrate, and then less than 1% each is pesticides and organics. So it, those results might fly in the face of um, intensive studies. 
And I think one of the, I think this is an important philosophic issue for scientists. We often pursue problems and we study those problem areas intensively. And then we're asked to generalize our results from that specific study. But if we study problems, we may not be studying the whole thing. So these are prevalence slash assessment studies and everything's on equal terms. And so for domestic wells, manganese is more prevalent at high concentrations than any other constituent, and yet we don't do much about it. So again, I'm gonna kind of keep emphasizing, it's not saying these things aren't a problem. In fact, it's the opposite. If you think these other things are a problem, then here's a set of other things that one ought to be concerned with as well. Then with respect to say time series, we are doing some work on time series. We've got 24 wells around the country where we have continuous monitors in place. There are eight locations, wells at three depths, and we visit those wells every two months. There are no continuous monitors for atrazine or for any, so we're sampling for the full analytical suite um, on, on this sort of basis. But if you started to say, look at epidemiology, well, 24 wells are not going to, to do that. And one of those sites, you know, it's just one of those wells has the same cost as a 30 well network. Because if you sample it for four years, you know, twice, you know, six times a year. Mm -hmm. So the costs just explode. Okay. Right. So that's, so the answer is we're looking at time series. We don't have the resources to do it at an epidemiological scale on a frequent basis. Knock cycle four. Okay. We have one more question from someone online. I'm sorry. I don't know who it is. I'm going to let you chime in and then we're going to take a break. Hi. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes, go ahead, okay. please. Yeah, this is Yo Chen. I'm calling from my field site in the Arctic. So, um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so um, I have a question for Ken. So you, you mentioned about organics and everything else. You <laughs> talked about emerging contaminants and um, I would say legacy contaminants. What about, I mean, the big thing you see in the news these days is PFOS and PFOA. I mean, is, is NACWA version 2.0 going to kind of address those issues as well? Um, well, the answer is yes. Again, the analytical schedules for those constituents were not available at the beginning of the cycle, so it wasn't sort of routinely built in. Right. And again, Rebecca, you can imagine what it takes to pull all this off, you know, 50 oh, yeah, water absolutely. science centers. Right. So everything's very systematic. We are sampling for PFOS compounds presently, and one of the aquifer systems we're sampling are stream valley aquifers. Right. That's an add-on. Again, because we ran this more efficient than usual, so we had some funding available to do that. So we added the stream valley aquifers, like the Arkansas River, the Platte, the, um, some of the ones in Ohio, and the PFAS are on those. And then all of our decadal networks that we haven't visited yet this cycle, we've added those schedules to those networks. Okay. So sort of the answer is kind of, you know, we 70% of the cycle went by and so those wells are in the past and we haven't figured out how to sample in the past yet. Okay, great. Thanks. Stay warm, buddy. <laughs> All right. It's not that bad up here. I mean, it was 68 degrees yesterday. Oh, oh. wow. Nice yeah. to the Nitsuka. Yeah, but the, but the skis. Isn't that the fundamental bad. problem with the Arctic is it's too warm? Right, yes. So, but today's a little chilly, but, but yes, it's been pretty warm. A little chilly. Yo, uh, this is Carl Rockney. Is this perhaps your project with Jennifer Gerard? It is. And she, I think she is in the cafeteria right now. Oh, okay. It's it's good to see our fourteen forty funds are being well spent. <laughs> so we're funding Paul. that project. <laughs> Take care. Okay. With that, I thank. Let's thank our panel. Then those two presentations were really terrific. Um, we let's take. Um, we we scheduled for fifteen minute break. We we went over a little bit. So um, let's let's come back at twenty five. Can we go that long? Yeah. Okay, we'll come back at um, 
Okay, everybody, please retake your seats. Okay, so here's the plan for the next hour-ish. Um, we have four speakers um, that are going to talk about, uh, give us case studies. So we're going to go back to our states and hear a 10-minute case study from each state. I'm going to time keep. I'm going to try to be really firm about the 10 minutes. We won't do questions right away. We'll just go boom, boom, boom. And then when that's all done, the four presenters, as well as our previous two panelists, uh, Ken and Jay, will sit in the front and we'll have a free for all. <laughs> okay, so uh, 10 minutes, go. All right, 10 minutes, not a lot of time to cover groundwater in California, although luckily Jay <laughs> kicked it off uh, a, a little bit, so so I'll, I'll try not to repeat some of it. Okay, so uh, we've got a lot of issues, um, quality issues, um, overdraft issues, and the, the equity issues that go with those, particularly when we have drought conditions uh, on the coast, we have sea level rise, um, and then we have this sort of broad, how is our, agricultural sector transforming uh, due to uh, the, the need to try to balance out groundwater basins. Uh, and then how do we get more water in the ground, which is what everyone would like to do. Um, it is certainly one of those things that is uh, easier said or, or planned for than done. So on the quality side, I, I touched a little bit on this this morning um, that the real focus has been on communities that don't have the capacity to uh, treat their contaminated groundwater sources um, and, and what is the state solution for that. We now have a funding source which uh, is going to be uh, in to the tune of $130 million a year, um, at least for the next 10 years, to really focus on the, the million people, and that's communities, schools, um, what we call very small systems with fewer than uh, 15 service connections, uh, as well as domestic wells, and try to get as many of those million people um, safe water, safe drinking water as, as quickly as we can. Uh, and then, of course, um, we have to deal with uh, the, the new uh, contaminants coming on the scene. Okay, so here's the map uh, of what the state's groundwater basins look like in terms of their level of overdraft. So the, the uh, orange colors, um, those are the, the basins that have the highest levels of overdraft. And as you can see, uh, that's mostly focused in the uh, the valley, although if you look down here at LA, I don't think this, oh, there it goes. Um, you can see that there are a lot of um, critical basins there as well. Uh, and again, what this really speaks to is um, what is going to happen over time as we implement this groundwater management law and uh, and and the agricultural uh, uh, practices have to shift a little bit. Um, so the law um, known as SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, was passed in 2014. Um, and as you can see, it, it sort of gives a long implementation time frame uh, to actually get to sustainability uh, of, of groundwater uh, basins. Um, and it's left to these uh, GSAs, groundwater sustainability agencies. There are uh, over 150 of them in the state um, to try to come up with a plan um, and then implement that plan, which of course can consist of many things, but fundamentally try Trying to get more water in when there's water available and curtailing uh, withdrawals uh, as as needed. Uh, and then five-year reviews. Um, the other thing that comes with this legislation um, is some more uh, data, which we hope will be particularly valuable uh, for all kinds of uh, future work, uh, particularly on um, who's using how much, where, um, and what's it being used for. Uh, at the state level, we've never tracked this before, and the records that existed before this law was passed um, were, were pretty sparse. Okay, so recharge, uh, which is what everyone's focused on right now because no one wants to ask the hard questions about, okay, when we can only pump 60% of what we were pumping, who takes that hit? Uh, uh, 
So everyone, everyone's focused on recharge at the moment, and, and these questions have arisen. They don't necessarily have answers, uh, but there's been a debate, for example, uh, in, in our uh, code as to what actually counts as beneficial use. Does recharge for its own sake count as beneficial use? Some people say yay. Um, our official agency position is no. Um, what happens when some of the groundwater um, that was uh, recharged is lost? Uh, People always focus on uh, if they they think they're getting their full share and then it's not there. Um, who can they blame? Uh, and then this this third bullet is a really interesting one. We have some of our wealthier water districts in Southern California have invested in groundwater banks in the Central Valley, and the question that that really gives me uh, anxiety at night is well, if we're in the midst of a deep drought. Um, even if that groundwater basin isn't empty, um, should that Southern California agency really get that water ahead of other people who don't have uh, the same level of resources? Um, what, it, what is that agreement really worth uh, in, in that emergency scenario? Uh, it's an interesting question to ponder. Um, and hopefully it, the, the, it won't be called to question that soon. Uh, and then of course, um, not all recharge is just let the water flow onto the ground and it shall percolate. Um, a, a lot of uh, recharge projects require investments. Uh, even if you're not direct injecting, um, you've still got to invest in the land or if it's next to the, the river, um, you know, do it in a way that you're maximizing recharge. Uh, we don't have necessarily funds for that although these groundwater sustainability agencies are supposed to be able to levy fees to help with those type of things. Okay, Jay alluded to this um, in his talk about, well, what, what, is, what do we really mean by sustainability? Well, as many things we do in California, uh, the language in the statute is very aspirational. The idea is that all the groundwater basins are sustainable, have a sustainable yield by 2042. Um, what happens when we're in 2036 and it's clear that half of them or more uh, will never be near that is, is again, an open question. We have about 2,900 community water systems in the state. We have 7,400 water systems total, uh, but 2,900 of them serve communities. And uh, we do an annual uh, electronic survey uh, it's not really a survey because it's mandatory, but uh, where we ask them a whole series of questions. And over the past couple of years, we've added additional questions about uh, climate readiness and uh, water loss, uh, distribution system loss control um, and rates and uh, a whole host of other topics. One of the things we asked them about um, in uh, the most recent survey was, well, what do you see as your, your biggest threat? Um, and what you can see here is of the responses, um, drought and groundwater um, are, are, are the highest uh, issue of concern for the, the greatest number of systems. And what this one shows, um, again, just focusing here, uh, is that um, of the systems, uh, again, um, the, the yellow bar is the highest, will not implement, but you have a significant number, the black and red and, and green bars here, that are have either built uh, deeper wells or drilled deeper wells or have it in process, that that is a, uh, an investment strategy that these drinking water systems are, are looking at uh, as, as groundwater levels decline. So here are a few more questions that we are grappling with as a, a, as a state and a society. Um, so the first one, uh, we have a, a state senator who represents um, the, the district w that uh, contains a lot of the Frank Kern Canal, which is um, one of these uh, agricultural water distribution canals that have been built in the state. Um, and it is breaking due to land subsidence, uh, due to overdraft. And so the question is, should us, uh, should Californians collectively as taxpayers foot the bill for that or not? Or should the people who uh, created the, the subsidence in the first place do it? So that's uh, an interesting debate happening in the legislature this year. Um, of course, uh, during the drought, we had lots of wells go dry. Um, and we know that in some parts of the state, those wells went dry because uh, next door was a, a well-resourced farmer 
or agricultural district that could afford to drill deeper and those shallow groundwater wells went dry. Again, who pays? Who's, whose responsibility is that? Um, so far, it's been the state as the uh, provider of last resort. Uh, we had a debate leading up to this year's budget about whether we should increase fees on fertilizer to uh, account for the impacts of nitrate pollution. It looks like that fee is no longer on the table, unfortunately. Uh, and then uh, we also have 150 odd new agencies that are now charged with managing groundwater. And there's been a lot of concern that the, the same um, well-heeled uh, uh, interests that controlled groundwater before will simply control these new agencies um, and, and will uh, continue perpetuating the equity concerns. So I think that you know the, the the big question here is what what does the future of agriculture look like in California? Most of the groundwater is used for agricultural purposes. We irrigate about nine million acres in the state. Uh, of those nine million acres, about half of them uh, are for grapes and tree nuts, and uh, those are profitable investments. However, they're also thirsty investments, and so. I think there's a big question here about as uh, these groundwater management agencies are forced to curtail some of the usage, um, what what will that mean in terms of the economic drivers? Will the, the farmers uh, shift to uh, maybe more sustainable crops, but that are not as high yield? And what does that mean for investors that have poured a lot of money into uh, certain types of grapes and tree nuts over the past couple of decades. Uh, and then, of course, second and third order impacts um, as uh, climate change makes uh, the, the summers even hotter in the valley and we see shifts north and west to the, the cooler areas. Um, what does that look like in terms of employment patterns, land use? Uh, one thing that I think um, is finally being discussed that, that, that was really a long time in coming is um, my agency has responsibility for managing the water resources, but we don't have the ability to run a workforce development and training program per se. But just as we saw, we witnessed at a national scale the, the transition um, over the latter half of the 20th century um, away from the, the, the Rust Belt um, and, and loss of jobs and, and, and those former uh, sources of employment, um, I think we have to think really hard and, and be really, um, really diligent about making sure that our agricultural communities, um, our, our, our farm worker communities, where production is going to decline, that there are alternate uh, economic uh, avenues for for people to to maintain uh, a, a living and and their own economic viability. So uh, that's that's sort of the 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 thing I'll leave you with is uh, from 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 our perspective in California that that's one of the biggest questions I think about how to how to do this all is making sure that we don't miss the 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 real human impact as we try to um, maintain the the environmental balance. So I think that's it. Thank you. So um, we'll go ahead and go straight to Florida. Um, is Tom on the line? Yeah, let me get going here. How are we doing? Uh, that sounds great. And uh, I'll, I'll interrupt you in about nine minutes and say one more minute to go if, um, if we're still. Okay. Take that's it cool. away. All right, so I'll try to move very quickly as well. So. Um, in my talk this morning, I made uh, a quick note of springs as being a priority and I thought I would uh, highlight as the case study here in large part because I don't think um, any other system would highlight groundwater surface interactions better. Um, and so I will start, if you go to the next slide. Let's see where I am. Okay, so um, as I said earlier, we had about 700 springs or more in the state of Florida, several first magnitude springs. They're iconic systems. That little uh, picture up in the left-hand corner is H.T. Odom, who did some seminal work in uh, some spring systems here in Florida and 
um, really was instrumental in, in doing some community ecology work and community metabolism work. And for the most part, springs in this state were thought to be dominated by these large vascular plants, the grasses primarily, with very little algae problems. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, oops. you can see here, this is uh, what a lot of our springs look like now. Um, uh, there's a high degree of, of filamentous algae in them. Uh, other invasive species and a, a general kind of decline or deterioration of the vascular plant community, the rooted vascular plants. Next slide. So the question is, you know, where are we headed um, in our state with regard to springs and why are they being degraded? And the, if you go to the next slide, this is kind of the poster child of what people think the problem is. And so the yellow dots there are um, indicative of nitrate concentrations and at the spring event and Wikiwachi Springs, which is a first magnitude spring in along the uh, kind of central Gulf Coast of Florida. And the blue uh, uh, symbols there are uh, population uh, numbers. So, uh, you know, in the last, you know, 30, 40 years or so, you can see that nitrate concentrations have increased in this spring system from background concentrations that are about 50 micrograms or so uh, per liter to now above one. And that's typical of most of the spring systems or a majority of the spring systems in our state. Uh, extreme increases in nitrate concentrations reflective of, of groundwater nitrate contamination. So if you go to the next slide, um, the question obviously is linking that observation to uh, the ecological integrity of, of the springs. And to kind of put a little more data to this, I'm going to highlight two systems that I've worked on for a very long time, since the late 1990s. And if you go to the next slide, there are, these are two spring-fed coastal rivers just north of that Wikiwachi uh, River system. Uh, they're about Oh, 10 kilometers in length and, and they discharge directly into the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna again look at the issue of nitric and concentrations. This is uh, a much uh, a truncated time period relative to the graph that I showed you uh, for Wikiwachi, but what you see over from that 1997 to 2012 time frame when we were actually collecting data um, at the, in the upper part of the river, you saw, in fact, an increase in nitrate concentrations from about 0.4 milligrams per liter to close to six in both of these systems. So uh, about a 50% increase in just a, a little over a decade. Next slide. And so concomitant uh, with that increase in, in nitrate concentration was a, a decline in vascular plant biomass. And one of the systems, the Chasawitska, the one to the south, uh, plant biomass decreased by about 50% in the Homosassa. Uh, by the year 2012, vascular plants were largely extirpated from that system. Okay, next slide. So where the vascular plants remained, you know, during that same time frame, there was about a fourfold increase in, in the paraphyton burden or paraphyton load on those plants. Next slide. So here's the, the, the narrative, right? And so it's this general eutrophication progression scheme that um, has been described by a number of people. This one actually was first described by Carlos Duarte uh, in mid-1990s. And, and it kind of goes like this, right? Here's the narrative. If you increase the nutrient delivery, you're going to ultimately enhance the microalgal and macroalgal growth. That, that algae is going to essentially shade out the vascular plants. But, you know, it's going to increase respiration in your system. Um, the vascular plants aren't going to be able to maintain a carbon balance, and ultimately they're going to die out. Um, and the system is going to lack the structural characteristics you need to provide uh, other ecosystem functions. So, um, so that's the narrative. And if you go to the next slide. And that led to this, right? And what we call the nitrogen limitation hypothesis. And it simply stated it's an increasing nitrate concentration in Florida Springs uh, have alleviated nutrient limitation, promoting higher growth rates of algae, which in turn have led to the proliferation of macroalgal, bloom, macroalgal blooms in Florida Springs. Next slide. So one of the things that is problematic about that simple narrative is that we neglected the grazing component in large part, um, and we've also uh, failed to consider some of the other physical and chemical characteristics in the system that might 
exert some type of influence on algal dynamics. Next slide. So there are, and I'll come back to both of those things later, the, uh, the grazers and, and uh, the other kind of physical characteristics of the systems. But mm -hmm. I want to just point out that there are some challenges to the nitrogen limitation hypothesis. And I want to work, work through four of these pretty quickly. Uh, one is the, the fact that the relationship between algal abundance and nitrate concentrations in the majority of the, if you look at the whole population of springs, that relationship's really weak. Um, when you actually look at the temporal kind of time frame of what's happening here, the, the nitrate enrichment in most cases uh, appears to precede the algal proliferation problem uh, by extended period of time. And when we actually do the experiments, uh, the assays in, in many of these systems uh, to test for nitrogen limitation, we don't see it. And then finally, when you actually look at the metabolism, um, what we see is that the nitrogen fluxes in the system generally far exceed the autotropic demand, even under kind of background uh, nitrate concentrations, as I said before, about you know, 50 micrograms per liter or so. So next slide. So here are some of these uh, things that, again, shed some, uh, some light, I guess, or some concern on the, the adopting that, that nitrogen limitation hypothesis. This is the relationship between nitrate concentration and algae cover was um, in, a, in a paper that was uh, published um, by Stevenson in early part of uh, in the 2000s. But again, this shotgun approach here doesn't give you much confidence that there is a strong nitrate algae uh, relationship in spring systems. Next slide. So when I say nutrient enrichment appears to have preceded the establishment of algal mats by considerable period, I mean um, by decades. You know, when uh, A.C. Odom was start, first starting to work in uh, the Silver River, Silver Spring system, 1950s, um, even by late 1950s, uh, groundwater nitrate concentrations were elevated, uh, pretty, you know, substantially elevated relative to historical backgrounds with no signs of algae problems um, really in the literature. Um, until maybe the late 1970s, maybe even early, late 80s and maybe early 90s. So when we talk about um, the, the time differential, I guess, oftentimes we're talking about decades. So next slide. So there's been a number of people that have tried to carry out and do nutrient addition uh, bioassays to determine what the limiting nutrient is in these systems. And, uh, the vast majority of them show either no limitation uh, by nitrogen, um, but more importantly, um, phosphorus often is the limiting factor in these systems. All right, so I, uh, another nutrient obviously of concern, but again, the focus is entirely on nitrate with regard to springs um, in Florida. Next slide. All right, so. Um, Again, I don't, I didn't, I wanted to make sure we had enough time, so I didn't put a bunch of data in here. When we actually do the mass balance calculations for nitrogen in the spring systems, uh, it does in fact suggest that the nitrogen fluxes exceeded the autotrophic demand even under historic conditions. Um, when we actually do the math, probably less than 1% of these systems, um, uh, I mean, well, in these systems, probably less than 1% of the nitrogen is actually used, right? That's available for uh, plant metabolism, plant and algae metabolism. So I'll just leave it at that. In the interest of time, we'll move on. So when we think then, well, what could be causing the issue here? Um, there's some work recently that suggests that grazers um, may not be in high enough abundance to actually control algae. One of the problems that we have is we don't have good historical numbers, uh, uh, abundance estimates of, of grazers in these systems. But we also know that oxygen concentrations have been going down in many of these systems. Uh, many of them are hypoxic um, and or anoxic. And under those conditions, the primary grazers, which are our gastropods, don't uh, feed well. And so the consumption is, of algae is, is limited. So nonetheless, the, the densities of grazers don't exist in most of these systems to uh, control the problematic algae. And so in that sense, the algae may have kind of um, exceeded a, a critical threshold. 
The one thing I wanted to talk about today was flow mediated impacts. And so if you go to the next slide, there's a recent paper in geophysical uh, research letters by, by Nathan Reaver uh, and colleagues. And this, I've taken two figures out of that paper for, to talk about here. The, this is essentially a conceptual diagram that talks about this concept of perhaps there are um, critical thresholds in, in stream flow velocity that affect the amount of algae that are growing on the surface of the macropipes. And, and so on the left-hand panel, uh, up and, and up, and <coughs> excuse me, uh, panel A, what you see is two kind of probability density uh, distributions. And one is for low paraphyte and cover, that's in the red. And one's for high paraphyte and cover, that's in the black. And essentially, if you, you go to the right of that panel A, what you see is that, okay, at the higher flow velocities, that you have low paraphyte and abundance on the macrophytes, and obviously at the low flow velocities, you have higher paraphyte and abundance. On the bottom panel B, that's uh, kind of a conceptual diagram of, of what might happen if you uh, interrupt or in restore flow in these systems with regard to uh, paraphyte and abundance. And it's set up in this framework where you can say, well, if we actually, if you look at panel B on the left side, at time zero, when you start off with high flow and, and, and low, a paraffin cover, but you interrupt that flow, essentially or restrict it and reduce it, you would expect an increase in algal cover. But if you restore the flow, if, um, if it returns to a low cover state, then there's no hysteresis in, involved. And so we're very interested in, in that mechanism as well. So if you go to the next slide. Maybe so, finish up here pretty quick. Yeah, I'm as fast as I can. And so these are the empirical data and essentially what this panel on the left says is, hey, you know, there is in fact a, um, a threshold that you see and it's about 0 0.2, um, 0.23 uh, um, meters per second, which is, is evident in these springs that's borne out by the empirical data. Next slide. And why that's important is when, uh, if you could take that cover data and convert it to uh, biomass data, there's, this shows you what the paraphyte and load that causes a negative effect um, by way of light transmission on vascular plants. And that has management implications. So next slide. What are the conclusions? Nitrate concentrations are increasing, no doubt. Submersed aquatic vegetation is declining, no doubt. The paraphyte and loads on the remnant plant populations are increasing, no doubt as well. Uh, the reductions in spring discharge are apparent and flow velocities have been shown to exert a strong influence on paraphyte and abundance with potential for negative effects on the submerged macrophytes. Where do we go from here? I think we need to better understand the relative influence of groundwater withdrawals on, and climate on groundwater levels and, and stream flows. And it's increasingly clear that there's not one hammer solution to the problem of algal proliferation in these springs. And finally, we need to understand more fully the interactions between nutrients and flow rates. There you go, done. <laughs> Thank you very much, great. Okay, Maryland. All right. <clears throat> So I, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about springs. I want to talk a little bit about streams. Um, and I, I'm always happy to see submerged aquatic vegetation. It's always a good thing, no matter where you are. So thank you for that, Florida. Um, again, the framework in, in Maryland is the Chesapeake Bay restoration. And, and for those of you that don't know that we've, Maryland has achieved our total maximum daily load control for phosphorus and nitrogen and sediment. Um, primarily through two um, control areas. The first one is by upgrading our wastewater treatment plants. So 50% of our nutrient reductions have come from improved wastewater treatment throughout the state of Maryland. Um, that's, that's a phenomenal achievement. Um, somewhere over 40, around 45% of the rest of our um, nutrient reduction has been achieved through annual practices in agriculture, specifically two practices. We have the highest proportion of farmers that practice cover crops um, and no-till agriculture. So those are so far to date how the Chesapeake Bay from the Maryland perspective has been restored. Our partners in Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, New York, West Virginia, DC have all been active players and they've, they've had slightly different strategies. 
Um, again, the second frame in Maryland is that, that climate change concern that we have in our active engagement, in particular that flashy weather that affected Ellicott City with those two 1,000 year storms in about two years. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with Maryland, we are the fifth most densely populated state in the nation. Small state, lots of people. Um, that trend of increasing flashy water means that there's a, a higher focus on our stormwater management. Um, of course, our stormwater management is um, impacted primarily by nine counties and cities that have 80% of our population and about 70% of our impervious surface. And like most places in uh, older developed um, Atlantic side, we've developed far before we had regulations around stormwater management. So most of our designed infrastructure is, is really just trying to move stormwater, not trying to infiltrate it or, or get secondary benefits out of it. So we've had a series of, we're working on our, our third generation stormwater management permit in MDE. Um, so generally what we try to do with our stormwater management is uh, restore impervious surface. So take that built environment and crunch it up and turn it into something else. Generally, cities don't want to do that. Roads, they don't want, they want to increase road surfaces and not decrease it, right? So um, in our third generation, we've doubled the restoration requirement. And of course, lawsuits have ensued. Um, we've insisted that 20% of unmanaged impervious surface have got to be treated, somehow treated. Now, that does not necessarily mean that we're requiring them to break up roads and concrete. Um, we've got science-based practices. So we have a team of researchers who help validate practices that can be used to treat um, impervious, service, uh, impervious surface. So stream restoration is one of the areas that I really want to focus on a little bit um, as a good news, bad news scenario in the state of Maryland. So again, just broad context, how we make our decisions. We need really good decision making to incorporate social benefits as well as science-based benefits. It can't be one dimensional. Um, permittees right now in the state of Maryland spend $1.5 billion to restore impervious surface. The cost ranges, depending on where you are in Maryland, from $24,000 to $42,000 per acre of restored surface. Think about that. Do you know how much it costs to put a cover crop on an acre of farmland? Between $45 and $90 per acre. They're equivalent, in fact, cover crop, you can argue for nitrogen is a better treatment solution. What are we doing? And yet our um, environmental colleagues are pushing us to move from these annual practices to permanent practices, restored infrastructure. I don't disagree with them, but economically, I can't justify it. I can't just change the impervious to non-impervious based on nitrogen. There's a cheaper, better way to do it. So if we should restore our impervious surface, how should we do it and why should we do it? How do we think about the future of our built environments and address multiple issues? And especially when the, the range of costs is, is orders of magnitude different. So stormwater um, communities are being pushed to look and to consider at large scale infrastructure shifts, future billion dollar investments. Um, right now, today, we use stream restoration. A lot of really good science behind it, um, well established and implemented by generally private companies. Some nonprofits are involved in stream restoration, but each company, each nonprofit has a slightly different model about how they should or design model that they want to implement on streams. In some of our urban and suburban areas, um, it requires large scale removal of trees. Yikes. 
Talk about managing the media. Hey, we're going to fix your stream and destroy your forest canopy. No, really, it'll be worth it, we think. So there's been a call to look at how the design works in different environments. Um, there's been a call to understand um, which designs are best. Um, we're looking at things like flow rates, uh, uh, benthic macro and, and micro and invertebrate populations. Um, we want to know how these stream restoration designs perform under climate change conditions with flashier water. Are we going to blow out these designs that are used in some cases to slow down velocity? Is that just going to be blown out and all that money is going to be washed down the creek, so to speak? <laughs> so we have a lot of questions. Um, there's a lot of different groups involved in this. Again, we've got nonprofits who have skin in the ga game. They've got a lot to lose if their design doesn't function. Um, it is part of both our stormwater management and our bay restoration program. So you can get financial inputs from both of those. That's a good thing, I think. Um, one of the things that the state has required any county or permittee that uses stormwater or stream restoration, they're required to monitor. Some of our permittees are doing a fantastic job. Detailed monitoring that they hook up to their flood risk assessment, they're doing a great job. They're looking long-term at trends of macroinvertebrates. They're doing a great job. Some of our permittees are not. They're small towns, they're communities, they don't, you know, they're slapping in a monitor here and there, sending out somebody, maybe the river keeper will do it for them. They're not, they're filing that with MDE or putting it on a shelf somewhere. Meanwhile, the state is asking all these core questions. Um, the good news in the state of Maryland is that we have a, a quasi-governmental funding agency, the Chesapeake Bay Trust, Jana Davis is the executive director, and she takes a funding source if you're, from around, you've seen our, our bay license plates, the funding sources from the sales of those bay license plates. And she suggested, hey, let's do a pooled monitoring approach. So this group has established a set of streams that serve as a base that they sample regularly. And then they regularly put out a call for proposals to address the concerns of the regulate, regulated um, constituents and the regulators about what is the performance of this stream restoration. So it's an approach that both includes long-term monitoring, baseline monitoring, as well as specific targeted questioning. We're on our, our second or third year now of our pooled monitoring approach. Our regulated communities, if they're doing a great job monitoring by themselves, they, they're fine, they don't have to change anything. But for those communities that either don't want to monitor or are doing a poor job, they can buy into the pooled monitoring program and somebody else will take over and do the monitoring for them. So we've got a lot of questions about what we should be measuring, what, what monitoring should go on forever. And at some point we sort of answer some questions, right? And we can probably quit monitoring certain things. So what should we monitor long term? What should we quit monitoring after we've established that a threshold has met? Is stream restoration an, an effective tool for impervious management? Um, where should we install these? What's the best bang for our buck? Um, headlands seems to be the answer. What about toxins? How do these restoration um, approaches affect toxins or not? Um, and how do we optimize the design to address multiple outcomes and make sure our investment strategies are really cost-effective, innovative, and getting us, cross, us across the line from multiple areas. So we want to make sure that we're withstanding climate change. We also want to make sure that the quality of life of the citizens of Maryland is improved with this large-scale investment. Thank you. Great. And back to Texas. Yeah, and here comes Texas for a sprint to the finish. So I've got a lot to cover in 10 minutes. Uh-oh, technical difficult. Okay, all right. Um, jumped ahead. 
All right, let's jump into it. Okay, welcome to West Texas, y'all. Where's Jay? Is he here? Suzanne appreciates that. Okay, I wanted to narrow in for my case study on a, a area of the state that's sort of a confluence of a lot of the challenges that I talked about earlier, specific Val Verde County. And this sits, uh, Val Verde County sits atop the Edwards Trinity um, Plateau Opera System that covers a large part of uh, the southwestern part of the state. Here in cross section, in terms of the hydrostratigraphy, these are Cretaceous age dolomites and limestones, namely uh, uh, built of, of two aquifer systems, the Trinity here at depth, and then the Edwards aquifer here at the surface. So this is the same Edwards aquifer that provides for San Antonio, Austin. Again, a very mature car system and moving from north to south with a really mature car system along the fault, faults down here in the southern part of the county. So it makes for a very interesting um, hydro, hydrological situation. In terms of the flow and occurrence of groundwater, um, Val Verde County is the regional discharge point for this entire aquifer system. And you see the flow lines kind of coming down from the north to the south. It flows down towards the Rio Grande and it discharges as base flow along the Pecos River, all along the Devil's River, and a number of springs that are sprinkled out through uh, the entire area. Um, and, and again, you really see well-developed karst development along these stream systems and down here around where the lake, uh, Lake Amistad is and then um, also in the southern part of the, the county. This also is a home to a number of very, very large spring systems, namely Good Enough Springs. I don't name these things, I'm not sure what it's called. It's more than Good Enough, it's a really big one. And, and it's actually under Lake Amistad, it's under 150 feet of water beneath the reservoir and still discharges about 50,000 acre feet per year. And then we've got uh, San Felipe Springs, which is the source water of San Felipe Creek. It discharges about 80,000 acre feet a year. So a lot of uh, water flowing through the system. In terms of the uh, overall uses of the Edwards offer in the, in the region, this is a really sparsely populated part of the, uh, the state, only about 50,000 people in total population. Uh, so Edwards offer is, is the primary source of water, but you experience well yields that are highly variable. Along these really well-developed car systems, you can have wells that produce 2,000 gallons per minute. You get in between the watersheds that can be, it's matrix porosity, it could be as, as much as a gallon per minute, so really highly variable. In terms of the uses, irrigated agriculture up in the upper part of the uh, county along the watersheds and these really pro prolific conduit systems are one of the main sources and then all, also municipal supply. But all total, all these uses added up it's only about 5,000 acre feet a year of total demand on this really prolific system. So in terms of the sur surface water sources, most of the surface water is sourced from groundwater. This is groundwater and surface water really coming together with the regional discharge from the aquifer or the aquifer discharging regionally in this part of the county. The Pecos River here, dominant groundwater sources, base, base flow. The Devil's River, it's entirely sourced as, uh, from groundwater as base flow, and it's a perennial river as a result of it. Then we've also um, got the Lake Amistad, which all these rivers flow into, which is an impounded uh, reservoir on the Rio Grande River built uh, for the purpose of, of flood control. Then, of course, I uh, uh, already mentioned San Felipe Springs here that sorts San Felipe Creek. All of this contributes to Rio Grande flow. Uh, Rio, flow in the Rio Grande. So one of the key takeaways here is that um, these flows are actually uh, supporting several uses. One of them that doesn't get talked about a lot is endangered species habitat. There's some really interesting uh, species that have been found within these car systems. Uh, one of the more interesting ones is this Mexican blind catfish that actually lives in the subsurface within the aquifer. And it's a Mexican listed endangered species, which means we also treat it as an endangered species. And just recently, um, there's been uh, the, the uh, Texas hornshell mussel, one of a number of uh, freshwater mussels that are being considered for listing, has been listed as an endangered species and resides along the Devil's River and the Pecos River and along the, the reservoir there. So these species are very, have, uh, require a very delicate balance of high quality flow that again is sourced largely uh, from this aquifer system. And then finally, this is a source water for a, sta for a substantial amount of con contributions to the Rio Grande, which we manage jointly with Mexico through the International Boundaries and Water Commission. All total, Good Enough Springs, Devil's River, and San Felipe Springs contri contribute 23% of the total flow that uh, is relied upon as firm yield 
for those downstream users all the way down into the Rio Grande Valley where there's substantially, a substantially irrigated agricultural economy. So any reduction in these flows could really affect those firm yields. So you've got a very interesting uh, circumstance where you've got very complicated hydrogeology interacting with surface water, groundwater, there's a source of these surface water features. It was made more complicated still with the construction of the Amistad Reservoir. This was built back in the 60s for flood control purposes. And once it filled, we started seeing uh, a dramatic impact on the groundwater down beneath it. Remember, this is built on top of karst topography. So it's, it's a really lousy reservoir, to be honest with you. So it's leaking through the, those rocks and actually impacting base flow up here in the Devil's River. was showing up here at Patrick Crossing at the stream gauge. It's also a geochemical signature of that reservoir water. And it's also showing up here at San Felipe Springs. And in terms of the hydrograph, you can really see it notably here where you've got pre-reservoir conditions uh, in the blue line there, and that's the trend line, about 100 CFS of average discharge. And then post-reservoir, you see really about 130, 140 CFS of average discharge. This is flow coming right out of uh, Lake Amistad. So again, even made more complicated. So if you were a, a water molecule, your path through the aquifer system would be rather circuitous, rather tortuous, actually, because um, you could start up here in the northern part of the county as Edwards Trinity Plateau groundwater, discharge its base flow, and uh, flow down into the Devil's River, move down into Lake Amistad, get pushed back down through the bottom of Amistad, circle back over here to the Devil's River at Pafford Crossing, and then move back through it and perhaps go in a big circle. Or you could discharge here at San Felipe Springs, flow on to the Rio Grande River, and then on down to the Gulf of Mexico. So very complex hydrogeology, very interesting situation. Um, in terms of groundwater management, here's where it gets more interesting. There is none. Uh, there is no groundwater district uh, in this part of the state. This is GMA7, those groundwater management areas I was describing. Here are all the districts that are located there, none located within Valverde County. So it's effectively unregulated. Rural capture is the only law of the land there. Nonetheless, all these other districts established a desired future condition for Valverde County, um, namely with preservation of spring flow at San Felipe Springs. They can't manage to that. There's no means of managing to that. But the net effect of the desired future condition is we ran it through our groundwater availability models and pro produced a volume of water that was available from the aquifer that goes into the state water plan. And that's 50,000 acre feet. So keep that number in your mind. So in terms of future development, 50,000 acre feet of availability with only 5,000 acre feet of demand makes for a very attractive resource for others that might be looking for water. This effectively puts a bullseye on the region for others to, uh, for future development. Um, so in terms of factors to development, it's unregulated. That's really attractive to some that don't really want to mess with any sort of government uh, interference or, or curtailment of your production. Um, it's a potential target for large scale export. In fact, the city of San Antonio, this was an article in the Texas Tribune. They were negotiating with landowners back in 2014 to put in a well field and pipe that water 150 miles over to San Antonio. That fell apart. They actually constructed one, a well field 150 miles to the north. So it is a potential target for export. Extreme drought could affect flows there. Increase in irrigated agriculture, center pivots are starting to go in along the upper Devil's River that are directly connected to the river. Um, and also uh, endangered species habitat. What was not considered in this delicate balance is that there might be 50,000 acre feet available, but we didn't look at the net effect on what, uh, how that would affect base flow and these, these delicate habitats. And then Devil's River whiskey, can't forget that. This is a real thing. Devil's River whiskey is made with Devil's River water solely to be able to call it Devil's River Whiskey. So they don't use a lot of water. I thought this was just more interesting than anything. In fact, they, they drive a truck down from Dallas, fill it up, 12,000 gallons, ship it back, and they brew a bunch of whiskey. It's more interesting than anything. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so wrapping up here, moving at a, a, a breakneck pace, very complex hydrogeology and hydrology, very uh, interconnected system. No groundwater conservation district, so it's effect effectively an unregulated area. Very attractive conditions for future development are likely a, a target. And in fact, future development could have impacts 
uh, if you uh, large scale development could reduce flows in the springs and also within the Devil's River, which ultimately have might have an endangered species impact or impact on deliveries downstream that we've committed to with our uh, compact with Mexico. And ultimately, more science and data are needed. And our agency stepped in to produce this report uh, just this year in December to help with our legislators because they're really wrestling with what to do with this. They've tried to create a groundwater district now for four sessions. They really can't come to grips with what they want to do. So our agency tries to step in to provide information um, for these kind of situations. And so I'll leave you with this. This is Valverde County. That's the Devil River, Devil's River. These are those carbonate rocks that form these beautiful plateaus. And this is that beautiful aquamarine ribbon fed directly from that source that cuts through it. It's the only unimpounded river in the entire state. And it's in its natural condition because it's out here in the middle of nowhere. Unbelievable landscape, though. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, could um, I ask that uh, all all of the afternoon speakers please um, squeeze up there on our on our table? And while they're doing that, um, what I uh, would just like to have a, a, a discussion Q and A. It's our last chance to really pick their their brains. Um, but I ask that you keep in mind, in addition to sort of synthesis kinds of things, what lessons learned, what do we know? Um, be thinking in, in uh, about what the what the national academies can do for uh the the challenges and problems that um they're facing in each of these various activities so um open it up to to, to questions and um I'll, uh, yeah thank you tom, tom are you still there yep Anything Wonderful. I, we're going to see if Carly can, via magic, produce your face so you will be joining us in... Uh, hard time with this at the moment. <laughs> anyway, so, okay, I'm going to get back to focusing here on names. So I got Dave Zomback and I got da the Dave, the double Dave. Uh, and then Mark. Go ahead, Dave. Okay, well, very interesting, and especially to put the different uh, cases and thoughts next to each other. I'm interested to get your thoughts about the challenges and the, the, the research needs, the development needs around uh, the collaborations required and uh, the, the, the data and tools needed that could help some of these collaborations. So uh, Suzanne mentioned Chesapeake Bay and Maryland's efforts. Pennsylvania agriculture is the big contributor and things aren't going so swimmingly uh, with respect to buy-in from the agricultural community in, in Pennsylvania. John, you just mentioned the Amistad Reservoir. I visited there uh, a couple months ago and it was intrigued by the, uh, that the reservoir is operated jointly, as I understand it, by Mexico and the United States. So it's interesting aspects to that, but uh, there's some collaboration there I, and there are challenges you just went over. I, and you've talked about you're, you're trying to get a conservation district together and what are the challenges in that. Jay, I asked you a question earlier about uh, the, the utility of the tool and you talked about its utility at the state and national scale, but you know how, how that translates down and um, to to individual ranch or county scale. Uh, and Max, you talked about uh, different communities with limited resources and how do you address those ability to collaborate and pool. So uh, that you all touched on this 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 theme of um, collaboration, and uh, and I think Suzanne, you said the. Uh, the biggest innovation in the Chesa whole Chesapeake Bay program is the human collaboration among the uh, the seven states involved and the different agencies. So there's that you know political aspect to it. But what can we be doing in the science and technology community to provide the kind of visualizations that Jay provided? That to provide tools, mechanisms. Um, I, I throw that out to all four of you. 
So I think there's a real um, pressing need. <clears throat> so from the on the university research side, <clears throat> um, I have been taking it as a challenge, and I, I still see it as a very uh, uh, important challenge that we co-develop um, integrated water management models. We have to be sitting down at the table with the stakeholders, with the water managers, with the NGOs, uh, uh, government agencies, um, because if we don't co-develop, we'll just sit in our offices and come up with some stuff that may not be that useful. Uh, so I think that's that's really important. There's a lot there's a lot embedded in that. Like, how do you do stuff that integrates measurements, uh, integrates satellites? It's it's a huge challenge. But then Suzanne, I think, sort of up the ante, and I agree with her 100% that we have to be thinking not only about water, but we have to be thinking about other issues that are important in a region. Um, so it's a big task. There are um, university groups and you know stakeholder groups, whatever that organize around certainly around the Chesapeake Bay and and uh, uh, I have a bunch of colleagues at UT that have done the Texas Water Research Network. And, Burn orange. There you go. Okay, awesome. You know I used to teach there, right? Did you yeah, know that? Okay. Did you take any classes for me? I didn't. <laughs> uh, Not on purpose. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's uh. That, that's a that's a big task, but I think it's really hard. So, like just today, just this afternoon, Max was talking about you know we're talking about irrigated acreage, and he said, so so what do you think is a good number? We're doing nine million, but what's a good number? And my answer was, you know, we need to model that, and we can model it. So I'll leave it at that. I'll I'll just add to it. I I'm fascinated about when I I go to my primary literature and I read about stakeholder engagement. It's a very, it has a very different meaning. I, I reckon that John and Max and I have a very different viewpoint about what a stakeholder is and how, what stakeholder engagement is. I think we're speaking different languages. Um, so when you read about stakeholder engagement, it's, hey, we have a little meeting and we listen and then we go and do our science. Um, I, I frequently have University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins coming to me and saying, here are the tools that I have for you. Um, and I asked him, well, where were you at the last Chesapeake Bay cabinet meeting? Where were you at the stormwater training session we had for our regulated community? You don't know the questions that we're asking. Um, you go out and find stakeholders that you decide instead of listening to the people who are really informing our needs, our regulated community, for instance. So I, I would challenge the scientific community to think very carefully about what that word stakeholder means and and ask the decision makers if it means the same thing to them. I, I was just going to make a point and piggyback on, on these other points is that for this particular circumstance and for others, especially when we're grappling with how to how to marry up surface water to groundwater, um, I think we need integrated models because we've invested heavily in Texas in our groundwater availability models, and we have our water availability models or WAMs that they are the permitting agency TCQ uses, but they're totally different types of models. They weren't designed to be compatible. Our legislators have been pushing in their their hearts in the right place, but. There's, they've been pushing for the GAMs and the WAMs to get back together again, even though physically that's not how it works. But I think there's opportunity to couple the models and to integrate them. And so just from a techn technology perspective, that could be something that could be a great benefit. But this, this Val Verde County example is, is a good example of where stakeholders could not get on the same page and where our agency, we're the third party unbiased providers of science and data, they really counted us to help reconcile things, which is why we're tasked with producing that report. But that's a perfect example of the Devil's River Conservancy commissioning a consultant to produce a model. Um, the landowners in Del Rio didn't trust that model, so they hired somebody to produce their own model. And then they asked us to step in. They said, we don't trust any of these models. You guys need to step in and, and help reconcile all this. So I think there's a very, very important role for our agencies to not only produce the information, but we have to be able to communicate it 
in a way to where it, it really can help uh, these stakeholders get on the same page and find common ground. So just to follow up on that, so, you know, I agree with both of you guys uh, um, and, and Susan, you know, most uh, academics are not great listeners, right? <laughs> I mean, we're just, we're just not. And, and, and so then like the personalities become important. Um, we have a fundamental problem in academics and that is that a lot of the stakeholder engagement isn't really rewarded. Uh, and so this is the problem. Either it's, you know, considered too applied or, you know, you're going to produce reports or you're going to build some integrated model, or maybe it's going to take us too long to build the model because we have to write papers and, you know, so there's a, there's a, like a disconnect. Um, and I'm getting a little frustrated with it um, because we need to work together to make a difference. Um, you know, we've got like a lot of smart people in, in, in that are working in research and, and teaching and, and, and uh, we're not really, you know, there's a, 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 a significant community that actually does want to try to make a difference, but there's no reward system in place. So you got to wait, you know, six or seven years for those people to get tenure and, yeah. So that's a separate issue that we grapple with all the, all the time. Um, I've been grappling with it for, for a while. Thank you. Um, thank, all, thank all of you for your presentations today. I have one technical question for Suzanne, and that is, what about all those sediments behind Conowingo Dam? Oh. Because I have heard things oh, about man. that. I, I think AP was calling me earlier asking the same daggone question. <laughs> um, um, so I, I, what's the highest and best use of that resource, right? It's nice, highly, you know, high nutrient sediments. Man, you would think you'd be able to figure out a, a highest and best use for it. Um, but it's really expensive to remove it. And then it's really expensive to dry it out. Right. And then it's extremely expensive to transport it. So um, our governor would very, very much like to um, get the Exelon to go ahead and move those sediments so that it can continue to trap the sediments that are continuing to come down from Lancaster County. Okay. Um, I don't think it's economically feasible. The dam, Exelon, makes a pretty good argument that says, we're just a dam. We didn't put those sediments there. <laughs> uh, how should we legally be held responsible for it? So I, I think it's an ongoing question about how, can we utilize, does it make sense to dredge out those sediments? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, a number of people, the governor put out a request for a proposal on using that resource. And um, to be honest, there weren't any viable takers. Okay. Just as a follow-up to that, and it does deal with your quest for us to look at this in terms of the board. Um, I was talking with Bruce Babbitt, former Secretary of Interior, a couple of weeks ago over the use of science and policy. Bruce, as Max probably knows, um, who was appointed by the former governor to try to bring together an approach to, into, to develop then called the California Water Fix. Bay Delta. Bay Delta. Yeah. Okay. It's had so many names. I can't keep them all straight. They keep changing <laughs> names, hoping that we'll move forward. Uh, <laughs> but what Bruce said to me is that through the years, and it's been multiple years, there's there's been a, what's that? 30 years. 30 years. A culture of crisis has been created. And he's all, he's all calling for developing a compact water compact for the state to see if yet another policy could solve this problem. My question for all of you is your perspective on the use of science in developing public policy. We can't do it all. We embrace this concept of adaptive management. I track 30 adaptive managements across the country. Few of them actually work. I can put it probably put on one hand those that really work and have achieved what it was intended to. I would like to get your perspective on what you think and how we should move forward. This is Tom. Uh, I'd like to weigh in a little bit here. So particularly on this uh, concept of adaptive management, and, and I agree it's difficult to see where that's actually working, but in order to be adaptive, 
you have to actually collect data. And one of the points that was made today is that we have all kinds of problems and we can never collect enough data. And from my perspective, one of the places that science can weigh in is they can help um, and I think Suzanne alluded to this, right? You can't monitor everything and you can't evaluate everything. You simply don't have the resources to do that, but you can do it in a scientifically defensible way. You know, what types of projects, what proportion of those projects, for example, would you monitor? And based on those findings, um, is that going to feed back into a regulation change or, or some type of management action? I don't think we do enough of that. Um, because I, again, I don't think that academics in general are engaged in the stakeholder process to the same degree um, that, you know, maybe that Suzanne's group, it, as she envisions it. So I think we have to be a little more assertive um, in that regard and, and think about what types of contributions scientists might be able to make as they kind of endeavor to kind of work in a policy or regulatory arena. I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, you know, a long time ago when I was in graduate school, uh, I was taught that scientists stay on the outside and they don't they don't get involved in decision making because that puts our objectivity in question. And, and I get that. And it's time to get involved. Um, we need objective thinkers in decision making processes. And I'm not ashamed as a scientist to step up to leadership and get involved. And I would challenge all of you to, to be involved um, in decision making. Um, I would say that the Chesapeake Bay program is built on the foundation of the science and technical advisory committees. And they are specifically answering questions that come down starting from the EPA, but working through the states, um, asking specific science-based questions about policy implications and tools, developing tools to implement our policy. So I, I'm optimistic. Um, I've lived and worked in a state that banned um, climate change. Um, and I've lived and worked in a state Wait, that- you banned that, it so you don't have it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> North Carolina decided that they were gonna ban sea level rise. <laughs> Um, I was part of the commission that reversed that as a scientist. Um, so I do think it's valid to get involved. Um, I do think you have to be careful about your credibility and find that balance. But, um, you know, science is a crucial component. And it's also important to elevate some of our other sciences, our social scientists, our economics that really determine the decision. I know we want to think decisions are made based on objective science. More often, it's economics and political sociological controls. Um, so making sure you understand those and you're not disappointed when one maybe less than optimized scientific approach is taken versus another. Let me add on to that uh, because uh, my answer is going to be, I, I think we need more collaboration between scientists and economists. I know some economists think of themselves as scientists, but I, I, seriously, I, because when it push comes to shove on in, in regulation or even in, in when legislatures are, are looking at forming policy, people who, who, who care about these issues want to know what the trade-offs are on, on the science. They want to understand, um, you know, okay, we do this, what's the likelihood of whether this fish species or this terrestrial species will survive, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, then you always get people coming in and saying, well, it's going to cost too much. Um, or, you know, it, the cost shouldn't be allocated this way or that way. And and really to have a, a, a full picture, you need, you need all of that information. And, and it needs to be integrated, um, to use to your, your word, Suzanne, because what, what's often difficult and, and what we're finally beginning to work on in, in California is um, so often we make these sort of point in time estimates. Well, here's what we think. Um, maybe here's 20 years that someone picked a discount rate and here's what it looks like. That's just not good enough anymore. Um, the, 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 we need more dynamic um, looks at, well, what if we have a lower discount rate because climate change is real? Um, and what, what about um, second and third order effects? Right? Often we look at, okay, we, you know, this project or this regulation comes in and this is what will happen. But actually, 
that will happen and then people will react to something happening and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and you have to draw the lines around the box somewhere. Um, but I think we, we really need sort of a, a more dynamic look. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, for too long in, in California, um, and I'll only speak for California here, um, water um, resource decisions have been made by engineers. Now, I like engineers, um, but uh, engineers um, are, are not necessarily uh, people who were taught sort of traditionally anyway, um, decades ago, are not necessarily making decisions that really take in the, the broad spectrum of, of all factors that we should be looking at in society. So I'll leave it at that. I would add to the economists, people who study communications. You know, I think the idea that policymakers can come to scientists and expect to get clear answers. You know, there's a group of people who study communications and, they, and it's a discipline like any other and that is a group that needs to be part of the mix. And you know, to sort of get provocative, the National Academy doesn't include social scientists. So it's not just the policymakers and the scientists not talking to each other, but even, even at our highest levels, we're not necessarily respecting certain disciplines in the social sciences as disciplines. And those folks have a lot to say about policy. So I'm going to take chair's prerogative here as an economist and perhaps one of the few social scientists in the room, uh, the integrated uh, uh, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So they, they do, in fact, uh, economists and, and some social sciences. However, you are correct that there's nowhere near enough. Um, anyway, I was actually going to wait till the end to ask this question, but it's been too perfect as part of the conversation because you've been talking about integrated modeling. And I think some of the earlier conversation about integrated assessment modeling was about groundwater and surface water or 3D water uh, or water and land systems. And I'm very interested and have done work with um, ecologists, hydrologists, and others on integrating economic models directly with um, things like the National Water Model would be really cool. Things like we've, we've done work with the soil, soil and water assessment tool to, to make those linkages all the way downstream. So I was going to ask if you all thought there was need for more of that sort of work and if you thought there was anything the academies could do um, in that arena. And of course, the NSF has had a strong um, uh, funding partnership um, and providing support in, in their integrated modeling um, with social sciences. So if, if you felt like you've already said what you have to say, fine, we'll move on. But if you have any more th uh, thoughts, I'd welcome um, additional comments. It's like I never met a microphone I didn't like. Uh, so uh, I think it's critically important that we do, <laughs> that we do more of uh, of the and so speaking from the water perspective, right? We don't really do a lot of integrating with economics, and uh, it's really to our detriment because a lot of the work that we want to do, if we could put some kind of a value on it, uh, we would be able to make a lot more progress in um, uh, underscoring the importance of whatever some new kind of flood protection or some new kind of recharge feature or something like that. Um, there's a great need. It's a, a super challenge. So I think there's a um, lots of room for an academy type study. Um, one of the challenges that you know I, I think about when I think about trying to integrate that into into model, include that in integrated models, is that predicting human behavior. So we think about think about say just water and and climate change. Um, it's really hard to predict uh, how people might behave in the future. Uh, how are people going to respond to, you know, how are farmers going to respond to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in 2036? I mean, it's really hard to know. How is it going to, how is it going to be going in 2036? How do you get this into your, into your model? Mm -hmm. Really hard. So a lot of, a lot of rich area uh, and a lot of, uh, uh, I think a lot of thought needs to, needs to go into how to do it. So I'm going to trumpet the, the, the model of how our agency works just to and show you how it incorporates sort of a financial piece of all this. I don't know if you all are familiar with the Texas Water Development Board, but it's a unique agency, unique to anything else that I've, I've, I know of in the country. But it, it, it's sort of half of a, a research institute that is actually also part of a state agency and half of a bank. And it really follows sort of a three-tiered process where my office, Office of Water Science and Conservation, we collect the data, 
We provide the information that supports state water planning. Projects are identified through this bottoms up regional water planning process to provide for long-term supply. And then we have financial programs, namely through what's called the SWIFT, State Water Infrastructure for Texas Fund, where $2 billion were carved out of, ironically termed, the rainy day fund in Texas, which was uh, oil and gas reserves that were sort of stocked away uh, revenue. And that $2 billion was leveraged to what we anticipate to be some 50 something billion dollars worth of projects. So we couple up the science and the data and the information with supporting that planning process. And then when it comes to funding a process or a project, then we have to make sure that what we have to understand the financial risk to the agency because we're using Texas's taxpayer dollars to finance these projects. So we've got a very robust office of financial analysts that really dig in, look at these cost benefit uh, analyses and make sure that these are viable projects. And then on the prioritization side of things, on the planning side, we have to priority these, prioritize these projects. And so the economics of them, uh, the, the finance is incorporated into all that. So it's a very interesting model just on the water supply side of things where science is the foundation for planning that ultimately uh, uh, provides the funding for projects. I just want to quickly add that when I, I talk to my scientific colleagues, um, when you think economics, you generally tend to tend to think um, taxes, um, and and there's this whole other community taxes, taxes. Oh. <laughs> the opposite of Texas. <laughs> there's this whole other community out there called business, and they have something to gain, they have something to invest, and in fact, some of our our greatest conservation um, um, wins have be, been in collaboration, cooperation with business. So um, please don't forget the private sector um, when we think about economics and their willingness, whether it's, um, you know, green investing or just straight up uh, beneficial support of water supply and anything else that they want to know, they want to be involved. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we've got several more still in queue here. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm troubled by today's. I mean, obviously, our groundwater is precious resources limited. It's clearly we're not managing it well. Um, and even where we have good programs, John, your last. Um, you know, comment that in, in that area, was you said four times to try to get a water conservation and it just doesn't seem to, to, to stick. And it just, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering then from the Academy, is there a need to kind of what would be the, the elements of a, that that's necessary that we would have management programs that would, um, you know, the, the, that would recognize this precious resource and, and need to have the kinds of controls over that. And it seems to be, and you know, we've got several different examples, you're all very different um, and with varying levels of success, frankly, by the evaluating. And actually, probably from uh, Jay's analysis, none of you are succeeding. You're, you're just, uh, you have a plan, a, plan, a plan failure, right? So. Um, so from the discussion, maybe you look at what, what would what would be the elements of program that you that you lack that you would really like to have to be able to have the right kind of you know controls or managements over over particularly groundwater systems. I I, I think the surface waters maybe maybe it's the lack of visibility, um, acknowledgement. You know, do we need a silent spring for groundwater? That idea comes to mind, you know, maybe that's the role academies can be this alarm bell, but um, I, I, you know, I think it's, I'm very troubled anyway. So help, help me out. So one, one thing that comes to mind is the need for national water policy and um, that includes both surface and groundwater. And again, you know, I think you're, I mean, the view from the top shows, you know, the bottom up, you know, and the top down 
Are we done? Is that what that means? No, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not sure. What uh, that means. Sorry, that's me. Uh, so the bottom up view and the top down view, right? It's the same view. It's, it's not working. It's not working. We're trying, but you know, we're we're mm -hmm. on a on a collision course. Um, and so to ward off that course, we need to have national level discussions, and it's really difficult to do because groundwater is sort of state by state, and right river basins are river basins, and we really sort of resist, yeah, Great Lakes, like stay away from the Great Lakes, uh, and it's it's really really difficult to have that kind of discussion, but it's exactly what's what's needed. I don't know how to accomplish that. Maybe it's a you know an academy report on the need for national. Is there a need for national water policy? And, and if so, what what would that look like? What would you you were <laughs> king for a day? <laughs> well, I was just about to say. So I, I don't listen. I don't think the uh, the ranchers out in Val Verde County would really care what the federal policy on water is. Um, what really what I've seen inspire more active groundwater management in Texas. They're very independent lot is the there has to be a real threat that something that is theirs could be taken away from them. It's like that quote from that attorney in that in that thirsty land book is that if I'm pumping it, it's mine. But if you're pumping it, it's ours. And they they really believe that. And I saw it in, in Hayes County. There was a threat of a big project that was going to ship water off to the big city. They got motivated and created a groundwater district that next session. The reason that there's been bills filed in Val Verde County is because San Antonio was in negotiation with well owners to move water to San Anto to, from Val Verde County to San Antonio. I, I hate to say it, but there has to be, on the very local scale, there has to be a threat for that rancher to actually get behind something like this. I don't think they would be that inspired by a national water policy, be frank. So, one thought here. I I mean, we, we always like to talk about multiple benefit scenarios and, and how to, you know, sort of improve conditions generally. But the, the, the reality is um, no matter what we do, um, they're going to be losers. Um, that, that's, that is the reality that a lot of people don't necessarily want to engage with. But, you know, one possible scenario here, I wouldn't necessarily call the report who are the losers and what we can do about them. But, but you know, to, to really look at, um, you know, over time, assuming, you know, different climate scenarios play out and, and the, the overall dependence uh, on groundwater, at least in the southern half of the U.S., um, continues to grow, um, what what can might we expect? I know you know it is hard to predict human behavior, but but to to at least be able to say w these industries, um, these types of agriculture in these places are are going to see declines. What does that mean in terms of food production? In terms of um, you know the, the transfers of water um, in our basin, uh, and 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 to really try to to map that out um, because that's not something I've seen done. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to, to, I just have to answer, sorry. I mean, I have to throw in a little bit again as an economist. So first of all, it's hard to predict human behavior, but we know very well when prices go up, um, people buy less. We know very well when there's scarcity and markets have to readjust, um, there are some winners and losers. And we have a lot of te methods and tools for estimating blind demands, elasticities, and all that sort of jazz that you heard when you were in Econ 1, that we, is, is what economists, is their daily bread and butter. And so those are exactly the kind of models that if we link more closely with the kind of uh, models that you're developing and talking about, we can do scenarios. So suppose this is what happens. Suppose we have a rule that requires uh, that doesn't allow us to move, move water from, from, from these uh, reservoirs to San Antonio. What does that mean? What if we do? Who are the gainers? What are the, the sizes? And we can also go that next step to say, let's design po policies to think about how to, once we do that, be sure that the, that the biggest winners compensate the losers. Um, and so that is entirely what people like me do and think about all day long. So uh, that's just, uh, I, you know, I, I think we're, we're hearing sort of very strongly that there that, that there's some pieces here that, that could perhaps be added. 
Um, the other thing I will just say, there was, there have been studies, a national, a national water policy and planning has been something that the Corps of Engineers was involved with. The Academy has done reports through the Water Science and Technology Board, sometimes at the bequest of, a behest of administrations, the Council on Environmental Quality, there was a report 10 or 15 years ago. So the need is known, but it, it, it has to have the political will to actually want to do it, and, and that's kind of kind of where we, we are now, but it, it, it's just, so that's just sort of a bit of a historical perspective, but um, really very rich conversation. Okay, so um, I have, we just had Mark, and now he's happy, he's calm, he's been taken <laughs> care of, so we'll check him off the list. Okay, now now we got we got a dozen questions from Nusha before we go to Carl, Ingrid, and John. Can I say um, something real quick? Is that all right? To... <laughs> Certainly, I'm sorry. Please chime in. I've just been listening to the conversation, and it, and it's an interesting one. And I, I'm going to circle back to what science can do and how they might, you know, inform policy or, or management. And, and so we've talked about models and, and making them more integrative. That means they're more complicated and there's more uncertainty associated with them. Um, and as, as an ecologist, right, one of the things that, that I've always tried to do is, is to investigate processes, general processes that kind of govern the systems that I'm interested in working in. And when we write papers, you know, we, we often get them thrown back at us because it's not of general enough interest, right? But the problem from a management or regulatory arena is we don't manage for the general, right? We manage for the very, very specific. And so what we have to do if we, as a scientific body, I think if we're creating these more complex models, we need to downscale them, whether they're, you know, a, a, a groundwater model, you know, from, from satellites or a climate model, or if they're integrating economics and, and all kinds of things. And I don't think we do a very good job of that, appreciating what the, the general model might look like. Are we making that uh, the tools available for people to take that general model, kind of downscale it um, and, and use it for their particular purpose, reduce the uncertainty? I think there's some, some real opportunities there for the scientific community to kind of be engaged in those types of discussions. So anyways, I just want to point that out. Thank you. Um, Nusha, how about one question? Let's see if we can, in the no next way. Oh, no. Okay. Well, I'm just going to point out that it's almost 10 to 5, and I'm sure we would all like to get out of here a little, not too much after okay. 5. So if everybody could just try to keep it within a, sh okay, two, two to three minutes for She's each conversation. I'm sure I try. <laughs> <laughs> if you would have taken me first, I would have oh. been done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't have 12 questions at the beginning. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few things, actually. One is, uh, building up on your comments, I'm a recovering engineer, and I call myself a recovering engineer because I have four engineering degrees, and then I went and worked for an economist for four years, learned the rope of uh, beyond Econ 101, how economists work. And then I worked for the legislature in California for a year and worked on all the national, mm -hmm. sorry, regional and statewide water policies, learned tons, and then ended up on the regional board. So basically, I called myself recovering because I learned how different groups think and then try to bring it back to academia, which sort of ties the comment that Jay made, which is, does academia really value something like that? Not necessarily, right? It's not conventional. They don't know where you to put you. Which box do you belong, right? So is it, are you a civil engineer or an economist or a public policy person? Or is there something in between? No, there's no such thing. So, so that actually highlights the challenge of academia because if you want to engage, then brings the whole concept of how do you engage because if you, are, you don't know public policy, you don't know where to come in. If you don't know economics the way that it works, you don't know how your ideas sort of um, add up to an economic value. And I think the biggest failure of all time from my point of view is this whole concept of economy with scale, which is killing us because everything is about economy of a scale. We build these dams because they were supposed to fit in an economy of a scale. The problem is they last only so long and we still think about economy of a scale but not thinking 
what is that scale? Are we talking about time as a scale? As are we thinking like 30 years, 40 years from now, who is going to pay for a lot of these things? That goes back to the uh, earlier comment about Florida and uh, all the projects that are uh, that are in place, and really makes me worried because actually we have been in the past five years trying to look at water demand and where it's going. And the reality is, even though we think we can predict what humans would do and how they behave, we actually do do have a lot of data and some modeling capacity to look at how people will behave when you communicate better with them, if you deal, if they have to deal with crisis in different points of points. Uh, you know, we look at Los Angeles. In the past 50 years, they have used the same amount of water, the population doubled. And they still have so long to go and so much to do. Um, so it's kind of like, it is actually, we actually are not that far from being able to see how people behave under various circumstances. The problem is we have, had, we have this whole top-down model. We think we know what's going on. We think we want to do this and this and this. It's easier not to, the reality is it's easier to not have stakeholders involved as much because they have a lot of opinions and ideas <laughs> and who wants that. Um, so so it's, it is a, it's an issue. And then on a, on a consultant, I know a few of my colleagues here are consultants and no, no um, hard feeling on that, but the fact is when we were dealing with the Groundwater Management Act in California, the first few meetings we hosted at Stanford was populated by all the consultants because they have never done groundwater modeling and they wanted to see what the university has to offer. Then they can just go back quickly, build a, a groundwater, ma groundwater model that way they can actually be able to get all these jobs by these water districts to be able to give them, um, you know, provide services, which is, which is important, but also the lack of academic involvement in that area is very important. And then last one um, is, Suzanne, I think just sort of going back to your comment on the regional monitoring, I wanted to say we actually in California, in Bay Area, we have this regional monitoring program that is actually built to deal with water quality in the Bay, and it's funded by the wastewater uh, treatment plants and has been quite successful. I, I would love to see how our regional monitoring program uh, pars with yours or learn. And one, one last thing about the comment you made about financing. We haven't been talking about financing enough. It is a topic that's not uh, looked at enough by academia because everybody thinks we already know how it works. The reality is we don't know enough. And I actually commend a lot of the work that uh, the because of Chesapeake Bay has been happening here on trading water quality, on uh, impact investment, on um, uh, you know uh, local uh, fees or uh, rates that has been sort of impacting the way people behave with stormwater on public private community-based public-private partnership. There are so many different ways you can finance these projects and we are not doing enough of it because we still think top-down government. Yeah, it's so. not sustainable. And and I, I on that trading, I, I have somehow been put in part in charge of managing a, a market for water quality trading. It's blowing my mind. <laughs> so I, I will accept any help from any source on water quality trading. Um, I have some ideas, but um, I have a lot more questions. There is an academic model out there. Kathy, you might remember if anybody works in an ag-based uh, environment, extension. Extension is the model for academia that reaches out and listens. So that's, that's it. Okay, we made it. Uh, Carl nobody is next. even responded to my call. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, then I have Ingrid and John. And then we're done for the day. Okay. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I, I think it got spirit. Uh, it started by Suzanne's comments about, um, you know, being involved in stakeholder engagement. And I, I, I think it, it ties in with what Jay said about academia and Nusha 
and what you brought up and what Dave was talking about um, a bit on what we do at NSF as providing the carrot. So um, I will toot the horn for the National Academy study for the grand challenges of environmental engineering. The fifth grand challenge is to better inform stakeholders. Um, we presented this work at our biannual conference for the uh, Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. Um, it was fun. It was emotional. There was a, a, a professor who got up and, and basically said they were doing this years ago and had difficulty in their career. It was, it was very emotional. Um, but what it, it really, uh, uh, I think, dramatized was that as engineers, um, we have to start understanding that our wonderful technologies will not be adopted if they are not part of the solution. And so what NSF has recognized this with a lot of our science, for many, many years, we have had the requirement of having broader impacts. You have to have that. It is a co-equal assessment of the merit of the project. If you don't, you will not get funded. That's a pretty big carrot for an academic. Second, um, we have a very, very large carrot in engineering in the engineering research centers. Um, a member of your board, for example, is involved with Renewit. Renewit has been one of the very successful engineering research centers that has brought into uh, the water sphere the absolute requirement that social sciences have to be involved in it. That has served uh, uh, as quite a model at NSF. And what we call Gen 4 on the ERCs has been uh, this idea of convergence. And convergence is a deep integration across um, cross-disciplinary boundaries. It is not a chemical engineer working with a civil engineer. <laughs> it is a chemical engineer working with a uh, maybe a dance instructor and somebody who, who does uh, archaic languages and things like that. And that has propagated itself to many, many, many cross-directorate and cross-divisional uh, initiatives at NSF. One I've been involved with this year was navigating the New Arctic and navigating the New Arctic had an absolute requirement. We had a wonderful project that was working with 20 different uh, communities up in the Arctic. It didn't get funded because it wasn't social science. It was just engagement. And so that's what we, we um, you know, we had these absolute requirements that you had to do it. Otherwise, you don't get funded. So that's what I would say is that there are carrots out there for academics to get involved. Um, and I, I think, you know, th there's a recognition now that uh, there's a lot of funding to be had if you do that, if you if you work with your colleagues. And, and then when I say talking to your colleagues, it's not down the hall. It's across campus. So no question there. I'm sorry, but okay. that's NSF. <laughs> and, and your yeah. colleagues are in government and in private nonprofit yeah. sector yeah. as well. So. Um, I guess what I was going to ask, it's related to what a lot of you have been already uh, talking about. Uh, Suzanne talked about, and you know, you talked and Carl did too, about scientists not really uh, engaging with real st stakeholders. I mean, the, in the broader impact, they say, well, you know, I have these stakeholders, but they're waiting until the last minute to really go and engage, and you've already gone through your meetings, but so there's not that real engagement. And you also mentioned that um, as scientists, we were not taught to really make decisions. We are told to really stay away, which, you know, it's, it's uh, something that has happened quite a bit. And um, Ken mentioned on the communication part, as you know, we're we're not really trained to be communicators. We're not trained to go to the Congress and say, "Hey, we need to make this policy." And and Kathy brought up the issue of um, integrated modeling, which has been brought up in different aspects, and that it's a complex, complex topic by itself, um, because there are many, so many models out there how to integrate them. But Kathy brought up particularly the one on economy. And I wanted to ask on the role of education and training in the long term in putting these things together for better informed policy and groundwater management. And it's not about training in groundwater, because we do that already. It's training about this multidisciplinary uh, aspects that have to do with economy and impacts and stakeholders and not 
training in terms of like, oh, I'm going to put it in a proposal so I get funded. It's like, really, I understand what the problem is. So um, I wanted to ask what you thought about the importance of that role of education and training in the long term, and if maybe that's something that should be um, thought of by the National Academies. <laughs> So in some sense, you're, you're kind of preaching to the choir. I mean, of course, we think that's important. I don't uh, really know how to do it. I think that NSF has the appropriate training program, so I've been out of that loop for some time. But like I said, IGERT, and then years ago, you have to be pretty old to remember the GRT program. Um, but uh, so I think that's great. My approach to that training has been just sort of just entrain my students and drag them along with me when I try to do different things. So we used to go visit Dave all the time. He used to know all of my students um, when he was working for Congresswoman Napolitano. Um, and so anything like that, you know, we would, I would bring the students along. And uh, so it is an integral, integral part of, uh, of education, understanding how to communicate with, with uh, policymakers, understanding how to listen and engage with stakeholders is right these are these are all parts of uh of moving towards say right a uh, uh, better groundwater management better resource management uh, so you know you could imagine that being part of a, a you know a special uh call or something at, at nsf and again my only insight into how to do it it was to drag my you know, my only experience was to drag my students along with me as I tried to figure out what to do. But we're not going to, you know, we can't really um, make any progress unless we try to have the training programs and try to bring the students along with us. I think, and, and I'll let John and Max jump in, but um, get, get, mentor them. And, and, and it needs to be us that mentors. Get them out for a semester. Have them come work for us um, in between degrees. Um, have them go work for a, a Congress person or a, a senator. Um, get them out of science. I, I, um, I think it's really important that they get out in the real world and really understand why and who makes decisions. Um, and, and also, Mark, I've been sitting here worrying about you. <laughs> I, I am extremely optimistic. And, and there is this model, the Chesapeake Bay thing, it, it worked. It's working. It's messy. It's complicated. I'm sure we spent too much money. And, it, and it's worked. So don't for a minute lose hope <laughs> that this can all come together. It ain't pretty, but it can come together. So... I okay. Think, I think the source of my concern was that uh, at the end of the day, I have to rely on the economists to, uh, to um, you know, oh, save us. So, uh, <laughs> but that's probably it. Probably is right. So, you know, anyway. we're scientists. No, no, Dude, we're scientists. Yeah. <laughs> that, nothing you indeed that, are. Nothing that a stiff drink won't fix. There you go. Okay, John, you get the last question, and then we'll do. We'll and we'll end. We'll have a two-minute wrap-up after that to next steps okay and and I'm channeling mark a little bit here um, it, it's kept me up at night and I'm not so sure it, that it should but you know we exist in a paradigm where surface water and groundwater are treated generally separately water quality water quality quantity separate and that's that's how our policies are set up our government our you know our agencies are set up etc and if if we look 20 years down the road, is this model on its way to breaking? And should we be looking at something different? And what does that look like to you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think the model is breaking, uh, and and 
you know, I, I, I won't say that, that we are that far down the road to fixing it, but at least in California now we've put all of those functions under one roof, so to speak. So that at least there exists the possibility for the people who do the water quality to talk to the drinking water people, to talk to the service water rights people and, and try to work together. Um, you know, forcing people to work together is never easy. Um, and, and whether that's in academia or in government or anywhere else, uh, but, uh, you know, necessity will get us there. Um, I'm not sure how we get there faster than necessity demands. But, uh, you know, if I had the magic wand, um, A, you know, th there would be, um, to be blunt about it, less local control. There would be more state control. Um, the, the, the stakes are too high, um, and the state always is the, the provider of last resort um, when, when bad things happen. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we, we sort of need to get to the place and, and this probably wouldn't resonate as well in Texas, but where, where um, there is an understanding of, of the value of regulation um, and, and regulation that, that tries to hit on um, sort of multidimensional um, you know, criteria, right? So it's not, we're just regulating for that one um, water quality goal, right? We're, we're trying to um, incorporate a whole bunch of different things. Um, but to do that, you, you do need a higher level of centralization and, and planning that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, but I'm a regulator, so um, every hammer is a nail. <laughs> All right, anybody else want to chime in before we... Uh... I, I have the final hammer here, so let's um, so let, let, let's end it there. First of all, let's uh, a full round of thanks um, to the panel and this afternoon. This this um this was an incredibly rich day. I don't know about the rest of you, but my head is spinning, and I'm still going to process and spend some more time processing. So I just want to um, end by saying a, a thank you. Uh, all the, the 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 big heavy lifting on organizing a day like this is people like Elizabeth. Uh, Stephanie, Laura, um, and our um, Carly, Brendan, the, the 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 staff folks here. So I really want to appreciate them. This is a lot of work, and it came together beautifully. So thank you very, very much for 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 doing that. Um, so with that, um, I and I. I think the, we will end. Um, there is a plan for a board dinner, so I'm going to let Elizabeth um, just mention that and then um, go relax, enjoy, and thank you again, all of you, for such an engaging day. Really excellent. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it, re it really was a rich day. I uh, appreciate all of the contributions throughout and your your fortitude in staying until uh, 5.15, that's great. Um, so the, the board members, uh, the dinner starts at six. Uh, a couple of you who are from out of town are, uh, have uh, been invited to, to join us um, um, to, to the dinner if you're able to do that. And uh, we will see hopefully many of you tomorrow morning starting at uh, around 8.30 or again whenever the spirit moves you. Um, there are uh, agendas back there for, for the day tomorrow. We'll have a, a number of interesting presentations, so I, th I hope that some of you can join us again tomorrow. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>